Hello, everyone. Uh, on behalf of the Tang Center for Silk Road Studies, I want to welcome you to the first day of the Gandhara workshop um, organized to discuss the history, current state, and future of Gandharan <coughs> studies. Uh, and also, what we wanted to do was highlight recent research conducted by the wonderful group of scholars uh, assembled here today, as well as those that will be um, joining us virtually tomorrow. Now, as mentioned in the program, this workshop is held in conjunction with the Beyond Boundaries Buddhist Art uh, from Gandhara exhibition at the Berkeley Art Museum. Uh, and it's curated by Julia White, who is here, and Osman Boparachi. Uh, so I hope all of you were able to see the exhibition, and if not, as Julia mentioned uh, um, yesterday, uh, it's scheduled to run until March of 2022. Now, I must say it's been very difficult to put this program together. Uh, we were committed to it being an in-person event. Uh, everyone seemed tired of Zoom webinars, and there um, seemed to be a real yearning for human connection, uh, for fertile conversations, and direct sharing of ideas. Uh, however, as many of you now know, as it turned out, some scholars were not able to travel to the Bay Area after all. Um, and Zoom does allow us uh, to at least listen to their papers, even if the format is not conducive really uh, to in-depth or for in-depth discussion. Uh, now, the good news is, as you can see behind you, uh, both days will be recorded, and our videographer, Mandy, will process the video, which will be then uploaded to our YouTube um, events page. Uh, and if you have not yet done so, please note uh, that you will have to register online for the Zoom seminar tomorrow, which you can do via our website. Now, with regard to today's program, there are some changes. Uh, Franz Grenet, scheduled to speak this afternoon, has been rescheduled as a Zoom presentation for Saturday. Um, he couldn't uh, we were going to do it instead of, uh, uh, we're doing it instead of um, Dr. Olivier uh, Bordeaux, who also couldn't make it. Uh, Olivier will tape his lecture instead, and we will add it to the workshop uh, recording after the fact. Uh, so just make note of it in your program if it hasn't, I think Frank has updated it, so it, it should be accurate. Uh, good news is that today we'll have some more time for discussion. Uh, and questions, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, and we'll probably move John Guy's lecture uh, up a little bit um, since we have time, and then maybe at the end of the event we can have a group discussion, which would be lovely. Now, we will introduce our speakers individually as we move through the program, but right now it is my great pleasure to turn the mic over to Professor Osman Boperacci. Um, it would literally take an hour uh, to list his amazing career, uh, all his publications, his archaeological work, and all the accolades he has received uh, over the years. Uh, beyond his erudition here, I would simply like to emphasize the qualities uh, that have made him such an amazing colleague, friend, and teacher. Uh, generosity, availability, collegiality, and hospitality. And I think our Buddhist and Silk Road Studies programs have greatly benefited uh, from that, from your presence uh, here on campus, and we look forward to continuing uh, that relationship in the future. So please help me welcome, once again, Osman Bokhera. Thank you very much, Sanjot. So it is with great pleasure that I welcome you to this workshop entitled Gandharan Studies, a Survey. Holding this conference, as Sanjot said, in the midst of a pandemic, threatening the entire world was not an easy task. You, will have, uh, you all have been gracious in tolerating each time we have postponed it. <laughs> it is so nice to see so many faces of friends I love after so many months of hibernation. Before I begin my brief introduction, I would like to thank the organizers of this workshop who, in the midst of the turmoil, did everything possible to make it a reality. First of all, my gratitude goes to Dr. Sanjot Mehendale, Chair of the Tank Center for Silk Road Studies. 
the pandemic forced us to improvise and to anticipate future events and to act with caution. Organizing this conference was a real challenge and she handled it so well. My thanks also goes to Karen Clancy, Director of Development of Outreach and Frank Beal, former uh, Program Director of the Tank Center of the Silk Road Studies, who hand in hand with Sanjo took uh, care of all the logistics and organization. Sanjot and I decided to organize this workshop because we felt the need to have an in-depth discussion on the current state of the future Gandharan studies, taking into account a wide range of archaeological, epigraphic, iconographic, and socio-political features. In order to answer these questions, we, we agreed to invite world experts, have experts in these fields. Some of them have come to Berkeley in person and others will join us virtually tomorrow. I sincerely thank all of you and welcome you. As Sir John Boardman has rightly pointed out, the arts of the Gandharan region in the early Buddhist period have attracted the attention of large number of scholars over the past hundred years, much of this activity being driven by attempts to research and identify Greco-Roman sources for iconography and individual figures. In fact, the subject is far more complicated and demanding, requiring a thorough knowledge of early Buddhist history and iconography, as well as mastery of Gandhari, Sanskrit, Pali, Tibetan, and Chinese sources rather than anything classical for identifying of figures and scenes. Finding of new inscriptions, manuscripts, hundreds of sculptures with challenging iconographies, and thousands of coins with new types and legends in the Gandhara and Greater Gandhara regions over the past 30 years have revolutionized our knowledge of Buddhist history, art history, and socio-political history. The discovery of an unprecedented number of inscriptions in Greek, Bactrian, and Gandhari enables us to deal, uh, deal with fundamental questions regarding the history of the Greeks, Scythians, Parthians, and Kushans who reign in Gandhara and in the neighboring regions. These new inscriptions gives, gives us, uh, give us a new insight into the economic activities, modes of production, and artistic states of this region. The finding of the Gandhari manuscripts dated to the first century CE in the form similar to Sanskrit version of Pranyaparamita, a main text in Mahayana, reveals that the Mahayana was popular in Gandhara. These discoveries showed very clearly one cannot no more support the old theory according to which there is little or no archaeological evidence for the presence of Mahayana Buddhism in India before the 5th and 6th centuries. Who would say better than Richard Solomon what we have learned from Gandharan manuscripts and inscriptions? Similarly, Mark Allen and uh, Ian McCrabb will talk about their extremely important digital framework for researching and publishing Gandharan manuscripts uh, and inscriptions. The coins are crucial for understanding the role of the kings, their chronological periods, and for assessing the geographical location of the various kingdoms. We look forward to the paper which will be registered and diffused in, the, in, in our site website by Olivier Bordeaux, who has made an in-depth dye study of these thousands and thousands of coins. The discovery of thousands of artifacts, sculptures, and ceramics has also helped to change our perception of Gandharan cultures. In this context, the ancient, recent, and ongoing excavations in Gandhara are crucial to our understanding of Gandharan studies. Thus, the papers by Anaphiligensi on the Italian excavations and Koizumi on the Japanese excavations at Sarderi will shed light 
on these recent and new discoveries. We are interested in their research methodology and the results of new discoveries. Need for a detailed analysis of iconographic configuration to better understand, to better understand the cultures, beliefs, and artistic production of Buddhist art in Gandhara is also emphasized in this workshop. In this context, Laura Giuliano's paper will certainly highlight the common tradition of Buddhist, Buddhism and Indian epics. The, impo the impact of Greek mythology and iconography in the distant lands beyond Gandhara will be discussed by Anka Dan and Franz Grenet. Serena uh, will tell us about the digital program launched by uh, the University of Bohum with the collaboration of Italian and Pakistani colleagues, which explores new perspectives and, uh, at the crossroads of history, archaeology, and conservation. It is also important to understand the impact of Gandharan art on Kashmiri and Hindushai iconographies. John Guy will highlight these characteristics of afterlife and beyond Gandharan art. Arno Betron will talk to us about the structures of Western Gansu Corridor prior to the Han Dynasty occupation. His research, his research will set an example to future research on the landscape in Gandhara. I do not deny the need to continue excavating the Buddhist monumental sites and to study and interpret the plastic art, epigraphy, coins, ceramics, and all the other historical and archaeological data within a theoretical framework. But it is also necessary to explore the broader cultural, political, socio-economic dimensions of the lay populations who were essentially farmers and their relationship with the Buddhist clergy. In this context, the study of the landscape Spatial and temporal relationship with different categories of sites related to the water management, settlement patterns, farming communities, and finally, to elaborate how those structures are spatially and economically related to the contemporary Buddhist monasteries. We hope to discuss these issues at the end of the conference and find a way to initiate new programs. So, our colleague from Pakistan, Mohamed Hamid, will begin our workshop with a focus on the perspective of study of Gandharan art. It is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, uh, Mohamed Hamid, who is Chair and Associate Professor of Department of Archaeology at Punjab University in Lahore. He received his MA in Archaeology from the University of Punjab in 2004 and then joined the Department of Archaeology at the University of Punjab as a lecturer in 2006. After serving the university for five years and getting scholarship uh, to study abroad, he went to Berlin and got his PhD in 2015 from the Free University of Berlin, where I met him for the first time with his Guruji, Monika Zin. <clears throat> While in Berlin, he had the opportunity to be part of international research circles and participated in the international conferences and workshops on different aspects of South Asian archaeology, which were held in Paris, Stockholm, Berlin, and Torun. His research interests include Buddhist art with a focus of the portable miniature shrines of Gandhara and Kashmir. His doctoral thesis provided the first catalog of these uh, objects the study of the origin of portable miniature shrines, their types, their iconography, and their religious significance are the main features of this research. So I kindly invite uh, Professor Hamid uh, to uh, present his paper. Sanjot must have an uh, announcement to. Yeah. Ah, yeah, okay. So, Hamid, this to you. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Hamir, and uh, uh, it's my first time uh, in, in Berkeley. And uh, let me say, uh, this is such a wonderful feeling 
to be here and uh, it's a privilege uh, to uh, standing here among all and uh, of, of course i'm i'm highly grateful for the organizer to give me opportunity uh, to be a part of this galaxy of uh, uh, scholars from all around the world and uh, also give me a chance to speak about my research uh, in gandhara i sincerely uh, thank you all and initially i wanted to i uh, speak about uh, uh, our or my recent discovery uh, which uh, which we made in southern punjab and these are the artifacts which you can see those were found from punjab area and actually southern part of punjab that is close to balochistan and the last town is dera ghazi khan from where we ex excavated a site and we will carry on excavation and these are the objects which we found from uh, that particular site so you can see uh, the first one is a diptych type of shrine and this is the only one which we uh, so far discovered in a proper content uh, context rest of the shrines which were in included in my uh, research uh, in my phd thesis uh, those were just found on different ways uh, in different ways we, we don't have the provenance but this is the first example that we have uh, uh, a portable shrine found during an excavation so this is indeed a kind of contribution and uh, discovery and you can see uh, the terracotta uh, sculpture or uh, the relief as well so this is a kind of addition to the gandharan that uh, apart from that uh, stone uh, reliefs and sculpture we also have uh, this in punjab side as well so uh, i'll start my presentation now uh, this is actually uh, contents of my uh, presentation that i will be speaking about uh, the perspective i really wanted to uh, share this understanding that how we uh, the students of uh, gandhara staying in pakistan how we uh, can, uh, perceive this art how how we study this art what are the shortcomings and uh, what we need to do uh, in future uh, of course uh, that would not have been possible uh, without the invitation and support of uh, uh, my uh, dear teacher mentor uh, and uh, and friend professor osman boparachi i'm really thankful uh, for uh, for giving the opportunity and for inviting me and then of course uh, i you know a kind of um, uh, uh, created a bit of trouble uh, by putting so many question to sanjot <laughs> <laughs> and also uh, frank frank billy as well so thank you very much for ignoring all my uh, stupid questions <laughs> and giving me chance to be here and uh, of course the uh, tank center of the silk road studies so i'm highly grateful for all, all of you people uh, due to your help and cooperation i made it here of, of course there were so many question that would i be able uh, to actually uh, get on the plane or not i wasn't sure actually in pakistan unless until i was <laughs> issued a boarding pass <laughs> so uh, of course thank to my vice chancellor my university and also my department for giving all the support uh, during our field work uh, this is the int uh, uh, introduction that starting from the ext extensive exploration and documentation of buddhist heritage in and beyond gandhara carried out by sir alexander cunningham to the ongoing excavation by the italian archaeological mission uh, gandharan studies are perhaps one of the most reputed field uh, which never suffered any setback or break this is uh, i believe the continuity of research work particularly by the foreigner uh, foreigners uh, has been producing so much that the local scholars converted their attention towards islamic archaeology and that's why we have a good number of publication explaining every aspect of islamic studies islamic art and architecture so when we compare to the depth of the knowledge with buddhist studies art and architecture the difference between uh, between the two is huge surprisingly even when many field activities and research work uh, have been done uh, since the independence and in collaboration with foreign archaeological missions including british german american japanese italian french and the latest chi chinese who worked at jangbadar 
uh, near Texla, but that's a different site. Uh, the present research work is a, it actually an attempt to evaluate, analyze the approach or perspective of study of Buddhism, Buddhist art and architecture, which are being done by Pakistani scholars and students. How do they perceive and understand Gandharan studies? What are the main reasons for that? What aspects are usually covered and what are left untouched? Which sense is prevailing and which has been addressed? What is the uh, what uh, has it contributed in academia and how the academia wo uh, world has benefited from the study uh, in the better understanding of Gandharan heritage? How is narrative art being studied and interpreted? Is there uh, any uh, dimension or effort to study the post-Gandharan impact of Buddhism and its tradition to the later societies? And what is the present state of Gandharan studies in Pakistan? And what practical and theoretical steps are being taken to improve our knowledge about Buddhism and Buddhist studies? So these are just the basic questions which I uh, really wanted to... So, of course, first, definitely uh, the acknowledgement and the credit goes to the foreign archaeological missions who have been quite actively participating uh, in, the, in, uh, in exploring the Gandharan art. We have the Italian and Japanese, British, French, American and German, either in the field or uh, away from the field, uh, inviting the scholars and doing the seminars, doing all the research. So these are the people uh, who have legacy of working in Gandhara art. And then currently, uh, the scenario has uh, changed a bit. We have uh, different foreign organizations uh, who are actually participating and actually doing their work in the preservation and restoration of Gandhara heritage in context of religious tourism. Nowadays, our new government is very uh, uh, much uh, active uh, in, uh, I mean to say, in reviving the tourist activities and the religious tourism is one of the uh, uh, top, uh, top, uh, top part which we are focusing. And with, in, in, uh, with that sense in my mind, uh, in the minds of the people, World Bank, Asian Bank, UNESCO, American, Swiss, and these all people, they are investing a huge money only for the uh, restoration and renovation of the archaeological sites. Of course, we are concerned with Gandhara. So this is the map of uh, Gandhara. And what is happening after the uh, involvement of these uh, uh, people, these foreign aids, that it has revived uh, religious tourism in the country. And there are many events which actually are happening. And you can see visit of the Buddhist monks from Sri Lanka. And they are visiting Gandhara. We, they are visiting Lahore, the collection in Lahore, and then the Taxla and other parts. So they are also uh, celebrating their religious events as well. They are allowed to practice uh, inside the monastery as well. So this is a new development and uh, the government is also encouraging. You can see uh, visit of Buddhist monks from Sri Lanka. So this is the indication that uh, 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 everyone can come to Pakistan and visit the sites. There is no such kind of uh, 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 threat or danger these people, of course, they are in their usual robe and they are allowed to move inside the country. So this is what actually going. Religious tourism uh, in the country is actually uh, developing. Exploration and preservation of Buddhist heritage is going on. And also digitization of sites and museum objects. Awareness walks are being held in order to this highlight the issue of uh, 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 religious tourism. And also we have public and private partnership. So this has not been the duty of the academia and, and the other people. So private sector is also involving in that because uh, they are actually uh, building up their businesses as well, traveling and hotel accommodation and everything. So because we have national patronage now, our president, our government, encouraging all these steps that you should invite uh, tourism and revive the tourism industry and more focus let me, let me say the more focus on, Mandha, on Gandhara heritage, on Buddhist studies. So we have uh, a huge amount of tourists from Japan, from Thailand, and uh, they are coming to visit their uh, places. So in this, in this sense, we have very bright future of uh, the field ahead. So let me talk about the excavations, which actually Pakistani scholars uh, uh, did. So we have uh, the excavation at Bidmount, and then we have at Hassan Abdal, Mord Shah Muhammad 
and then we have Pandheri near uh, Bikshali. We have that Bikshali manuscript, and then Swat, Budkada, three actually. Then we have Abasina and Zardheri, and nowadays this uh, Zardheri is being excavated by Archaeology Department, Hazara University. And then we have Badodheri, another Buddhist site in in Mansera. So then we come towards the area of Punjab. We have that that uh, evidences of uh, Buddhist uh, uh, period in at Katas Raj. When we have the, the report is published in Punjab Archaeology, and then of course. Excavation was uh, done in ba uh, Badalpur, Jinnawali Dheri, Bhamala, Mankiala, Nihang. That's a site, very important site near Sargota. And then we have Sui Vihar uh, near Bhavalpur and Dilurai, Dera Ghazi Khan. This is the site, very important, from where the objects were, uh, were found. So this session, which was recently, recently uh, completed by KPK Department of Archaeology, and they, uh, they were excavating a site, Abasina in Swat. This is actually the location of the site. Uh, basically, the culture activities have a lot of excavation at Kushan era Buddhist site. This is Abbas, uh, Abbas China in Najigram Valley. It is known for its large number of Buddhist structures discovered by archaeologists E. Berger and P. Wright in 1938. According to archaeologists, the site is one of the largest Buddhist complex housing three main stupas and two votive stupas, domed viharas, assembly hall, monastic cells. Other structure of the complex are scattered along the mountains. So, why I included this? Because here, uh, this is the overview of the site, and these are the evidences which were found scattered on the surface, not in a proper context, but you know, uh, scattered uh, or fallen from their actual uh, location. Again, you can see these are the fresh discoveries uh, in January 2021. So the remarkable thing which the remarkable thing uh, which actually uh, we have from this site is discovery of uh, Buddhist fresco paintings. And during the ongoing excavation which was then, uh, they found first century AD coins and fresco paintings as well. So these paintings are among one of the earliest Buddhist frescoes so far discovered in ancient Gandhara. So when we talk about painting, we know about the Italians who worked in uh, in Butkada and they found only one sample of uh, paintings. You can you can evaluate the uh, the decades they are working, but uh, this painting aspect is is not there. But now when we uh, take into consideration uh, the Buddhist painting from Jinnawali Dheri, and then we have this uh, this painting from from Swat. So actually, this element is is now growing. That there exists the Gandharan school of painting. It was al always there. So since it was not uh, in in the mind in the mindset of the people who were excavating, so uh, it was ignored. It was ignored by the excavators. It was ignored by the people. It was ignored, and then it was destroyed during the excavation. Through either through human hand or through natural. So once uh, you are excavating a site, and once the uh, this uh, this fresco painting is you know just uh, discovered or uh, it's not recorded, then ultimately it will be destroyed. So this is actually what happened according to my point of view. So I will have. So you can see the painting uh, depiction, and if we have paintings in Kizil. If, uh, sorry, if we have paintings in, in Ajanta and we have paintings in Kazil and then we have painting in Dunihong, then why not painting in Gandhara? So how can we disclude uh, Gandhara from that particular side? So uh, from this onward, the feeling is now getting strong that when we are excavating, we should be very careful that there is a chance to find a Buddhist painting there. So these are the fresh examples. Here you can see and these are from proper context. You can see the painting there. Of course, again, we can see the painting. Of course, these are these are damaged, but we can reconstruct the paint, uh, uh, the painting, the line drawing. There are expertise available, not in Pakistan, of course, but of course, our Western scholars, friends, they know how to, uh, you know, reconstruct the painting. So we have that in context, 
and then we can study in the context of uh, Israel and Ajanta and then China or Central Asia and also Afghanistan. Again, another close view of uh, the painting as well. Another view of the painting. So I'm thankful to the people in KPK because I'm using the photographs and uh, these are the, for the first time uh, shared in international platform. So next is archaeological excavation at Zardheri. Of course, uh, this Professor Osman mentioned that uh, Japanese have excavated the site and, and we have now the excavation report is also available published. But still, uh, of course, the projects are going on. Archaeology Department, Hazara University, uh, they are again excavating this Zardheri site. And now we talk about uh, the excavation reports. Okay, there is a spec that excavations are going on, but how the people would know uh, will know about those excavations. So I have just uh, uh, included example from Bamala. I hope everyone is aware from with Bamala that this is the site from where uh, the largest sleeping Buddha uh, was discovered from Bamala. And then excavation report we have for the 2012 and 13, and then. Uh, for the year of 2015 and 16 that has been published in ancient Pakistan and frontier archaeology. And the excavation we did uh, in 2020, a uh, preliminary report of that excavation has also uh, published uh, in a journal. Uh, one can just google it and find it online that uh, the content and the report. Of course, the preliminary report is found online. So. So this is actually we are concerned basically with Gandhara. I'm not going to in, in, in detail that where is Gandhara and what are the main site. My objective is to uh, study. So what is happening after the excavation? So next thing is the museum collection. So before partition, we had only three museums, Peshawar Museum, uh, Taxla Museum and Lahore Museum. But then, you know, the excavations uh, carried out by the local and the foreigner and that's how we got so much of the stuff. Then after partition, uh, these museums were established. We have there those in Mardan, Chakdara, Chitral, Hunt and Islamabad Museum. So these are the museums located in the core area of Gandhara. But uh, this collection of Gandhara is also uh, found in National Museum and then in Faisalabad Museum and also Bhawalpur Museum. We have pieces of Gandhara art in these museums as well, which are, which are located in area of central Punjab and, and uh, southern Punjab. So then we have also museums, departmental museums, university museums, which also have collection of uh, Gandhara art. And this is the one is uh, in Peshawar University Museum, very rich collection of, of Gandharan pieces. And then we have the one at uh, Abdul Bali Khan University, Mardan. And uh, fortunately, in my department, we also have a section of uh, Gandharan uh, objects as well. So these are the museums from where we can find this collection. So next thing is, uh, OK, we have the objects. Then we have in the museum. What about the publications? So when we talk about the literature available, uh, in Gandhara, uh, uh, published by uh, local scholars, then we have three types of uh, uh, work published. One is just for general people, that can be pamphlet, the people who are visiting uh, uh, the museum, they have uh, the pamphlets uh, available to them. And then second category is the guidebooks about uh, whole of the museum, not actually the Gandharan gallery, but whole of the museum. And then third, we have this uh, uh, stage when we have some catalog of the Gandharans. So these are available. Uh, the catalogs of uh, available from Peshawar Museum, uh, Taxla Museum, Swat Museum, and uh, Lahore Museum. Uh, let me tell you that these are individual efforts of the of the authors of the scholars. No such funding is involved in that. So author just. Uh, just uh, taking their own understanding, their own responsibility to work. So they are actually doing at their own behalf. And then if we uh, 
we should not or i think we should when we compare it the foreign scholars the catalog with foreign scholar just like akerman uh, ingoat fachina korita and zwolf uh, ha have written of course we cannot compare the quality we cannot compare the the contents but again we must consider that the people who are doing in pakistan they are doing just on their at the, on their own so that's why things are there uh, uh, missing links are there but we should appreciate the work is being done so what are the problems why they are not writing in the catalog so the problem are that it's more than one reason access to the material is also not easy as you all have uh, uh, definitely you have been so, so many years into gandharan studies so access to the material is not so easy uh, and then we uh, we have the staff is limited and then incomplete archival record of the artifacts i'm talking about gandharan artifacts so not a uniform method of documenting the collection gandharan pieces if they are in peshawar museum they are using different kind of met, uh, method in in lahore different kind of method in in national museum different kind of method. so there is no uniformity in arranging the record and then we have uh, these again the question of provenance objects uh, where did this they come from and what is their provenance uh, status what was the original number given to that object while after the excavation or it was when sent to the store and something we don't uh, know the uh, exact number as well so what is the museum number uh, and which was given to that and uh, on what basis was it based upon acquisition number we also have the acquisition number as well uh, was it given considering the date or type of the material and why do objects have uh, come uh, uh, have more than one number you often see more than one number uh, you know written uh, uh, on the, on the uh, on the object on the artifacts and when we when you go back to uh, consult the archival records then sometimes those number numbers are missing and you don't know where you stand now uh, what to write about that object so then we have uh, the biggest collection dumped in the store so what happened to that store collection and what happened to the pre uh, partition collection which was sent to india as well so again it's a very difficult uh, procedure to find out the relevant record and how many pieces came from indian museums and how many were given to museums uh, in pakistan or uh, where to trace the history so these are the basic things which are not available so there is a logical complaint i would say that lahore museum uh, where we have the best gandharan collection of course but no detailed catalog is available so the complaint is logical because when you have so much this is one of the best collection i would say and i would rank it uh, uh, from peshawar as well we, we can have, have the best pieces in the home museum but we don't have any catalog so why would uh, some of the other collections are very well studies talking about lahore museum if we talk about uh, indus valley we have indus valley collection that is very well studied uh, cataloged coins we, you have people know about <laughs> uh, about the coins and then we have paintings and also uh, these uh, sikh uh, collection nowadays and no work has been seen in on the big, biggest collection so personally i experienced this because myself and under the supervision of dr safur rahman dar uh, since one year uh, we are working on a on a on a book that is about sikri uh, uh, artifacts and sikri sculptures Uh, but we are facing the issue imagine the person who has himself worked for 25 years in the museum and when he decides to write a book he has to uh, face difficulties to find the actual record so doing our our, our effort to document the sikri collection both in pakistan and india uh, we have no support of course again i would repeat that that we are uh, doing it at uh, our own behalf and difficulty in access, accessing the existing record and relevant archival material is not available so no financial support is there uh, we have organizations uh, which support the people but not all people <laughs> so this is again uh, some kind of some sort of shortcomings so once the work is completed then there is a second problem to uh, publish it or to print it 
so imagine after uh, doing all the hard work what happened to the uh, to the written material so these are the difficulties so in such a background uh, problems are there also for the new researchers so people are there to work but we need to organize and channelize the whole process publication about museum collection we also have uh, uh, gandharan sculpture as i mentioned that it was written uh, in 1993 and then mohammad ashraf khan he wrote catalog of the gandharan stone sculptures in uh, in in taxla and then ehsan ali and naim qazi they about uh, gandharan uh, catalog in peshawar museum and then recently a book published uh, safura mandar dusting uh, dusting of doubts a story of waxing and waning uh, fortune of gandharan collection in lahore museum now we come to the next stage what are the phd's this is the list of phd's available uh, in pakistan so of course i i wanted to share it with you people to study uh, to have the overview that how topics are selected in pakistan when we have millions of uh, of objects then what would be the selection of the topic what you need to study we have that collection a huge collection piled up in museums so when you talk about this uh, this gandharan study we have these this person these individual these teacher these friends who have done their phd related to gandhara uh, should i go one by one okay uh, the first one we have political and cultural history of kushana period in pakistan study based on numismatic evidences that was completed in 2006 and then we have mr ibrahim shah i i included it uh, uh, deliberately it's about hindu art in pakistan a study based on museum collection and then we have it was completed in uh, uh, 2007 and then we have tahra tanveer uh, buddhist collection of wali aswad it, its history classification and analysis 2012 and uh, then we have this uh, mr mohammad qasim jan pushkalavati in antiquity and analysis of its uh, ancient history and archaeology and then we have mr tawqeer ahmed a cultural profile of gandhara and appraisal he is also my teacher the former chairman of the department as well uh, miss alia jawad the gandharan education system its source structure and legacy and then we have sadid arif archaeological and cultural history of nimogram a case study of buddhist sites in the swat valley and then we have uh, uh, this uh, uh, nasha bin this malaysian student actually study and analysis of brahmi and sharda inscription from gandhara its impact on religious cultural and historical landscape of the region uh, you can see the heading this is list of phd's gandharan study which were completed in university of the peshawar that up actually referred university of the peshawar and then we have uh, mohammad sher khan narrat- narration and illusion in buddhist art a case study of relief panel from swat and zarawar khan the buddhist narrative release panel a study of collection of directorate of archaeology and museum khabar pakhtunkhwa zafar hayat khan archaeological profile of buner pakistan study and analysis of the recent investigations nidaula sehrai gandharan pillars typology cal and chronological study ghayur shahab buddhist stucco and terracotta heads in the collection of peshawar museum a stylistic chronological and petrographic study miss samia anwar impact of central asian artist artistic traits in the jewelry of ancient swat valley 2019 and then the recent one is miss zubeda yusuf clothing tradition of ancient odiana as evidence from the buddhist sculpture in swat pakistan and it was completed in 2020 uh, luckily i was one of the uh, uh, experts of that uh, 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 phd thesis i was i was there during the viva then we have list of phd's completed uh, in kaidazam university taxla institute so we have uh, mohammad elias bhatti uh, his topic was impact of kushana dynasty on gandhara art in pakistan a case study of taxla that was completed in 2012 rafiullah khan uh, this is much more like historiographic study beginning of archaeology in malakand swat and then we have uh, sir faraz khan beginning of archaeology in malakan swat they have divided the, uh, the portion uh, from 1896 to 1926 and then 1926 to 
and then we have uh, amjad pavez analysis of buddhist sculpture a case study of malakand collection in swat ifkat shaheen archaeological activity at taxla from the beginning to 1947 then we have abdul azim classification and stylistic analysis of zard heri sculpture shinkari hazara tahir said did his phd in buddha stone images in sub regional office peshawar classification and stylistic analysis and then we have mr abdul ghafur history classification and analysis of regional styles of narrative reliefs and then we have ruksana sayed mohammed cultural heritage resources of the nilam valley this is a, a different kind but the, she included some uh, buddhist element as well masihullah khan the architecture of buddhist period monasteries of taxla mahmudul hasan ramadas and other miscellaneous collection of the buddhist stone sculpture in taxla museum question of their provenance and then the last phd which was completed in 2020 that was mr fawad khan and pedestal depiction in gandharan sculpture a case study of peshawar museum collection so these are the list of phds from uh, taxla institute of uh, asian civilization and then we have phds other phds i would say uh, rifat dar she completed her phd a, 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 the topic is stucco and stucco related clay sculptures from taxla and gandhara valley that was completed in 2009 lahore college from women university in lahore and then we have uh, the phd uh, is my friend and abdul hamid an analytical study of the archaeological discoveries from bamala completed in 2016 and then there is a thesis submitted uh, of uh, samar majid classification and stylistic analysis of the buddha sculpture in the national museum of karachi the thesis have been submitted the foreign reports have been received and now the only one report from local author is just they are waiting and then the viva will be conducted so i would request you uh, just let the author complete and then maybe you can use the reference and then we have another list of phd's from foreign universities these are the foreign universities and the scholars who completed their uh, universities from uh, 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 from foreign countries and the last one is uh, the me completed in 2015 <laughs> so we have that title as well so then we have the published thesis okay we have the phd's then we have only three uh, phd's which have been published in book form the one is of safur rahman dar hellenist hellenist uh, influence in the architecture of taxla it was uh, completed in 1973 available in the form of book and then we have uh, thesis of zainul wahab greek presence in the south of indian kush gangudhar excavation is also in uh, uh, greece and english and then mr abdul samad the emergence of hinduism in gandhara so these are the three uh, books Uh, based on uh, dissertation you can see apart from that we have uh, other authors who have written books about gandhara gandhara art or any aspect of gandhara here is the list uh, from ahmed asandani to ih nadim we have so many people writing about gandhara now if we compare or just analyze uh, the research that what actually it addresses i have gone through all the all the uh, titles so the topic actually they touch upon the Uh, in the whole research they i think they touch main aspects the in depth study the compare comprehensive study of the art iconography religious text and other thing that is missing and what they actually include descriptive account of buddhist collection from any museum based is the classification then we have excavations the objects from museums the objects from uh, private collection regions sites material pillar dresses jewelry greek impact and hinduism so these are the topics which actually are covered during uh, in these phds we don't find uh, i would say the in depth study uh, how uh, this philosophy is integrated into the art as well so the reason is i, al- I already mentioned that we have so many collections so many of the sculptures and they haven't been you know re- registered counted or documented 
So what we are doing actually in these PhD is actually documenting those objects. So at least they should uh, they include photographs, their provenance, and and the material. So this is actually the thing we are doing at the moment in Pakistan about Gandharan studies. So how the art is being studied? So the art in Pakistan, if we talk about Gandharan art, that is uh, being studied in purely aesthetic basis as a branch of fine art, not as a Buddhist art in connection with Buddhist stories. Relationship between artifacts and Buddhism is not highlighted and archaeological history of art is missing. So artists do not like to study ancient art. This is the dilemma. So Buddhism as a religion that has never been studied. What is the theory of religion? What are its fundamentals? How did it develop? Uh, what is, are the elements of spirituality? So no course is being offered in universities to teach uh, these sides of Buddhist uh, Buddhism. Then how we can interpret the art? So when we have uh, uh, we have this uh, uh, lakmuna and there is no proper study of faith, even when we talk about Jainism. I mean that is not only confined to Buddhism. Again we have this in Jainism in Hinduism as well. The only faith study is Islam. So due to the lack of understanding of Buddha, uh, Buddhist uh, Buddhism, we have to face difficulties. The interpretation of the subject matter of the art is very traditional. One of, on the other hand, foreign scholars have been studying the art in depth, including the depiction of water, fire, altar, sun, stambhas, dome, harmikas, chatras, and many other uh, elements, uh, their textual narrative and spiritual meaning as well. Those are explained the way we have, uh, uh, I mean, yesterday it was the presentation from uh, uh, Professor Osman. This is what I'm, uh, I try to say. So no concept of studying narrative art in connection with religious literature. This is actually the shortcoming. So the majority are even not familiar with the names, title, divisions and type of uh, Buddhist sacred religion, uh, sacred text, text I mean to say. So we know about Mahanism and Hinayanism, okay, that's good. But there is no understanding how it is reflected in art. How did, uh, did the non-figural art change into figural art in Gandhara and why? So these are the questions, those are not. So then we have critical approaches lacking, which stories are popular in which region and why? How single narrative has so many variants? Which characters are in in included in the imagery? and their roles. Correlation among the artwork in stone, metal, stucco and relationship with one theme. If one episode is depicted using different medium of uh, uh, I mean material, then what is the difference between this? How we find uh, the, uh, the difference in the character? And for instance, if we talk about fasting Siddhartha, here I would like to float an idea uh, which you people, you must uh, help me. We are very confused when we say fasting Siddhartha and fasting Buddha, referring to the sculpture uh, in Lahore Museum, we call it, or even when we challenge it, then they show us, okay, foreign is, uh, they are also using fasting Buddha. So I think we should uh, use one as fasting Siddhartha some, so to minimize the confusion as well. So no license among artists, archeologists, historians, religious scholars, and paleographers. European, American and contemporary arts, they are being studied in depth, but no focus on the Buddhist art as well. So Pakistani perspective, I think is missing. A uh, huge potential is there to work uh, uh, in the art. And of course, the art appreciation is also uh, needed there. And same is the study with the study of uh, its style, composition, color scheme, philosophy, subject matter. So why? at that place and not at other important sites. Talking about the painting, if you find painting in Swat, in Jinnah Wali Dheri, then why not in Dharma Rajika and, and, and you know the biggest monastery we have Takht Bai and other sites. So of course I would say no one to blame, uh, either archaeologist or art historian local and for I, I don't blame uh, anyone because Italians were the first, as I explained earlier, to find a one piece of uh, Gandhara uh, painting in Swat, but now more examples are being found, recently found in Swat, which I shared. So what were the main, uh, what were the main reasons? So as per my understanding, I believe that there was the, uh, this mindset to find Gandharan painting remained absent. 
we have had this illusion that gandhara has no school of paintings even when uh, uh, we find paintings in afghanistan and india so this reminds me of marshall's perception perception about texla valley uh, when he said that there are no prehistoric evidences in texla so but afterwards uh, we uh, we found that there are prehistoric uh, evidences in hathial and also in sarai khola those were discovered and then similarly no sign of painting during the early period of the research in gandhara this also developed an understanding that here paintings are not available so due to this miscalculation of uh, of the pieces of evidences i believe that we lost much of the art since no attention was uh, given during the excavation except to find uh, and identify art pieces made of stone stucco and metal so if there were traces of paintings those were ni- those were neither identified not preserved once exposed they were actually destroyed through human and natural agencies so however after the discovery of paintings at jinnawali dheri in taxla in swat the perception and perspective they both are changing people doing work in the field and those doing research in the uh, uh, are not uh, getting familiar with uh, are now actually getting familiar with this new addition in gandhara namely gandharan school of paintings so the hypothesis hypothesis was there Uh, gandharan school of painting it was established by monika zin that there was a gandharan school of painting and now it's getting a firm ground and strong evidences in gandhara as well similarly we have elements with gandhara architecture only two books only two theses were completed which actually address gandharan architecture the first one is from safura mandar and second one is from masiullah but those are confined to the taxla so stupa and monastery architecture or religious architecture is the core area of understanding but comparative study of the regional differences needs to be done religious architecture of taxla valley peshawar valley swat valley this needs to be studied the layout how then how we can study the layout of the settlements planning of the complex division of the main parts style of the building inside the particular monastic establishment so these are the aspect which have never been studied and then we have more important elements related to architecture that urban or civic architecture is missing so archaeological uh, missions very few who have done the work uh, we have that civic architecture in taxla charsada and udigram but what about the other places so we this is a weaker part of gandhara art that we are not actually uh, exploring the civic architecture which definitely had impact on their religious architecture stupa and monastery who were the people who were uh, those those were financing the huge amount of uh, these stupas and monasteries and the people and the monks there were definitely societies so when we are not actually uh, uh, focusing the civic architecture then we are forgetting the civil side and social side of the society and that's so we don't know about what was the status of buddhist society living around those monasteries so this is a major question which i think needs to, to be addressed and uh, uh, these we have in other parts as well so i will quickly just go to the next slide so current status of paleography is also there so no significant contribution we have although we have the uh, modern names like harry fogg and richard solomon thank you sir jason nilas and john allen but what about pakistani side only one book has been written that is indian paleography by dr a h dani after that Uh, no such contribution was uh, done in the field of uh, this paleography so manuscripts are available but expertise are not there so dani and nasim khan we don't have then the legacy that is continued so for numismatic evidences we only have uh, gul, uh, one professor so this also creates lack a lack of opportunities for the upcoming scholars who want to study script and language we have in our library a rich collection of sanskrit manuscripts the wonder collection but that is laying there without any support and without anything so we have offered a course that was uh, that is the preliminary sanskrit but it is, again it's on the basic level so in this sense we uh, we find no future of paleography and sanskrit study in pakistan which is actually valuable uh, source of information when we want to study gandhara art sir then my next point is why gandhara or gandharan studies re- confined to gandhara region only it remained it still is the same so it has narrowed the the scope of uh, gandhara study or buddhism so 
understanding of gandhara architecture is also limited art is limited we know how it spread towards northwest and uh, but what about it spread to downwards in punjab and other areas so this needs to be uh, what was the form of buddhism in punjab beyond gandhara and what was what was the shape of buddhism and why did it vanish from gandhara all of a sudden without and we don't have any reference so decline uh, whether decline was gradual or it was just all of a sudden why hinduism and jainism survived till recent time but buddhism failed instead of having that uh, enjoying that royal status during that period buddhism or uh, jainism didn't uh, that enjoy that status but it kept alive till 1947 so why then buddhism disappeared all of a sudden so what about the post gandharan side of uh, this uh, uh, heritage which we have we haven't studied that that point that gandharan study and they have any post gandharan influence so what happened with the buddhism in punjab as well so concept of stupa and monastery architecture survived in what shape i would say it still survives when we talk about mosque architecture we have that madrasa so mosque you can associate with the stupa and madrasa you can associate with this uh, monastery area so what is the linkage between hindu temple dharmshala tombs and madrasas and carvans arise as well so jain communities they have halls they have temples ashrams so what is the reason is there any continuation they learned something from buddhist then they continued into uh, uh, in translated the same idea as per their religion so what was the reason so what is the symbolic representation of imam i just touching a very sensitive issue we have we have that uh, uh, symbolic representation during ashuras when we have that horse and we we associate with with our you know heroes and uh, but when we see it in sanchi and berud again the horse is depicted there so their horse is depicting you know uh, uh, the lord buddha and here we have another uh, association uh, association to, to that so i'm not going to that details as well so again coming back to one more sensitive issue that is Uh, this one so we have that uh, here so uh, and most of the people most of the objects are from pakistan as well uh, the thing i want to say is people who do not want to keep that idol in their houses but they are collecting to sold it to sell so they are collecting and they are selling it just to get a enough money because when we were studying islamic art then gandhara became popular in west so the the demand of antiquity it developed and then we people got the idea and then they started searching for uh, those things and just uh, making illegal digging and then selling uh, those pieces so most of the gandharan uh, collection in, through the worldwide is comes from uh, the objects from gandhara but that is not through the conventional yeah, yesterday uh, sarasman talked about one uh, one uh, specimen which then was sold somewhere else so to find answer we need to buddhism uh, to look for the evidence of buddhism beyond gandhara we have these sites where, where we have the evidences and this is uh, rokri mount near uh, miyawali and this is the stupa remains of a stupa in rokri which actually sir alexander kingingham recorded right at the bottom this is actually the stupa exposed by the river indus showing basement and steps still under water this is in punjab this is in miyawali and then these were the sculpture buddha head which were discovered from that site and it was uh, those were given to the lahore museum and they are there and then we have another stupa in punjab that is sui vihar stupa you can see the difference of stupa structure uh, depending upon the material and we have that uh, 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 sculpture of the buddha in dhyana mudra but you can see it in Uh, uh, in terracotta rather than in stone so we have the sample we have the examples we have the, the artifacts in punjab but we uh, we need to explore the, these things again my argument is uh, you know just became stronger when we discovered this newly discovered diptych from uh, the lurai excavation and you can see the size as well and this uh, it gives us new uh, type of uh, portable shrine which we have and these are the other artifacts these are the bullets which were discovered from uh, during the excavation i was also doing the excavation and uh, also 
you know, uh, collecting these. You can see the Greek element here as well, and you can see how this language was there uh, when we talk about Southern Punjab. So this is Gandhara on one side, and that is Punjab on one side. And here we have these objects. From Rawalpindi, we have Mankiala. For Jehlam, we have this, uh, uh, you know, uh, Nand uh, Nandana Fort. I also excavated the site. Then in Miyawali, we have their stupa. And then in Sargodha, we have that manuscript. And then in Dera Ghazi Khan, we have this uh, uh, sculpture. And then Bahawalpur and Rahim Yar Khan. So these are the central uh, uh, cities in central and southern Punjab. So we have these evidences. But uh, because no such uh, uh, exploration has been done, no extensive work has been done beyond Gandhara. So that's why we have limited amount of uh, evidences. But I believe that there are evidences which will be explored once we start exploring Buddhism beyond Gandhara. And this is the much closer picture to that uh, which I was referring to uh, and I was discussing Professor Richard Solomon. So this is the manuscript which discovered in Nihang, in Sargodha, uh, in the central Punjab. Uh, of course, uh, it was discovered during illegal excavation and now I have the license to have a salvage excavation of that site which I will definitely uh, start in next year. Again, you can see I don't know how many pages, maybe more than 200 are there. So this is the new discovery. And of course, it tells us about the existence of Buddhist, uh, Buddhism in that part of the world. So the conclusion is that, that uh, we divide it into two phases, pre-partition and then after partition. So after the partition, the biggest factor was this religion, the religious sentiment, the country was founded or, uh, or established on the basis of uh, Islamic slogans. So then once it was established, so then people starting working on Islamic art and archaeology, which was actually not there before as a, as a, a proper subject. So, so the credit also goes to the Pakistani scholar to introduce subject of Islamic archaeology in South Asian history. So that was happening. And on the other hand, discoveries were made in Indus Valley Civilization, we have Harappa, Mohindado, Kodiji, Bambor, Mansura. Other sites were excavated, but Gandhara was left entirely to the foreign scholars. So scholars in Pakistan depended upon their inherited knowledge. So when Ahmad Asandani established the Department of Archaeology, he had to study, teach or offer all the courses, which include Gandhara study as well. So he was able to start excavations at Char Sada, and then we have uh, this, uh, th then he got the opportunity to interpret Gandhara art as well and its chronology, since he was also uh, a learned scholar of Sanskrit. The next stage was when uh, the foreign missions, they just withdrawn due to the uh, difficult situation in the country. Uh, they were no uh, more there. Then the burden shifted to Pakistani scholar, Pakistani community, Pakistani organization. So they started exploring, they started documenting the heritage. And then uh, we have uh, that uh, phenomenon that we established museums, we collected artifacts, we documented the fresh material, and then KPK is uh, doing research in the field. And then Gandhara became popular among the local people as well. So the focus was study again was to document uh, and thus it re remained confined to the descriptive study as a uh, study as uh, I have already explained. So again, what is the way forward? So why not? this in-depth study was taken because uh, we were not, uh, they were not permitted to work in detail in that uh, thing except Islamic art. So we introduced that subject, but Gandhara suffered a great setback and there was no solid foundation, no proper understanding, no institute which offered this, uh, this thing. So then we must take into con consideration the financial, administrative and lab issues as well. We don't have the laboratories, equipped laboratories as far as Gandharan uh, uh, art and its preservation is done. The work is being done in, uh, is not appreciable as, uh, as we are doing, uh, uh, you know, excavation and making new discoveries. But still there is a, there is a hope that people are doing uh, new PhDs. They are working on it and uh, the scholars who get opportunity to study abroad, they have different kind of understanding. But since most of the studies uh, being, uh, being carried out are being done in Pakistan, so the level of study is descriptive. So we cannot compare the international level and then the national level. So we are still struggling 
and uh, uh, not in gandhara but in overall archaeological activities but for the gandharan studies we owe a lot to our foreign uh, agencies and friends and let me take this this liberty on behalf of pakistan researcher to convey our deepest regards and thank you all for your uh, to being there to help us to tell us something about uh, uh, in fact everything about gandhara art thank you very much Thank you very much for that very, very uh, comprehensive and interesting uh, survey of, of all the uh, interesting work that you're doing, you and your colleagues. Um, I notice you don't make any mention of any Indian scholars or scholarship on this subject, and I wonder if there's any possibility of collaboration, either remotely or in communication, uh, with, with scholars across the border, so to speak. Well, to some extent, there is a problem. Uh, because <laughs> your people are very much familiar how the political scenario changes and then if we are there, if we have established a kind of project, but when we are into practical stage, then things get much more difficult. So we have been trying, we wish and we must and we uh, will keep on trying to, you know, just uh, take the uh, that side uh, on board as well. But I think the question is similarly important to the Indian <laughs> scholars as well. So they are also facing the same problem. So it's uh, uh, on both way, uh, on both ways. But keeping in view, uh, we can be we can hope for the best. And the reason I inc didn't include because I just wanted to show how we are actually studying Gandhara art and how what are the shortcomings here. Uh, excuse me. Thank you very much. I learned so much. Uh, and I learned how much is happening in Pakistan that I don't know about. But, so I had one question about that. You had a, a list, uh, a very impressive list of PhD students. Uh, I have no idea about most of them. But I wonder what, what happens to those students. Do they get relevant uh, employment in universities or elsewhere? Yes, to that extent uh, it's encouraging that once they complete their PhD or during their PhD they are involved as research scholars, research students in the projects national or international and then afterwards whoever wants to continue the study or continue this field they have the opportunity to work in our government uh, sectors as well as we have this private sectors now. Uh, I explained that religious tourism is, is expanding so there are so many NGOs who are there and they are also looking for the people who are expert in Gandharan studies in order to give the round to the tourist. So we have KPK Department of Archaeology, we have Central Department of Archaeology, then Provincial Department of Archaeology as well. So those who are getting PhDs, of course it's not easy task to do to, to there, but once they complete their PhD, they have their uh, uh, placement and sometimes people who are, who, who, have already, who are already in job they are actually continuing the study. The reason uh, I, I say that because I included four to five names, uh, Dr. Abdul Azim and Tahar Saeed, these are the people from Central Department, DOME, Department of Archaeology and Museums. And they, uh, first they got the job and then they, uh, uh, they, were, uh, they pursued their PhD studies. So we have both types of the people and scholars, but uh, as far as uh, uh, the placement is concerned, it is actually not to the highest level of expectations, but there are opportunities and they are availing it. Thank you. Last one, Mark. Uh, you mentioned a couple of times about the, the, when fresco paintings are discovered, for example, that many were not preserved and then destroyed. Can you talk a little bit more about the destruction, the damage that happens, how much of it is due to exposure to the to weather, to the air, how much of it is due to human? Yes. That was my point that uh, we have extensive excavations in Texla Valley, in Peshawar Valley, in Swat Valley, but though there is not a single record of finding a painting during that excavation reports, if we go through, the, of course, I didn't include the unpublished reports as well of the excavation, those are also there. So uh, there are no such information, there is no such information existing unless until we find that uh, that such kind of painting has been discovered. So now, uh, just I mentioned that there was mindset that in Gandharan sites we don't have paintings. 
so it was entirely you know uh, uh, was away from the uh, mindset of the people who were excavating so that's how that crucial piece of evidence is destroyed i think so once they are exposed they are vulnerable to the environmental condition we have that uh, uh, rain rainy season and as well the other thing though the direct impact well, unless until those were kept buried it's okay but once they are exposed definitely those were there but destroyed so luckily when we uh, got a chance to look at uh, the other thing which i must uh, admit that is not always the principal investigator is there to always you know supervising the excavations so we have that labor we have those people we have those students who are not familiar actually what is going on there so they will stop once they travel or once their once their pick axis hits to to that hard surface that is stone so they will understand that there is something structure going on there so stupa in monastery we have this kind of uh, uh, basic structure which we we follow but uh, other than that they are not giving the, this uh, uh, this information that you should be careful while exp uh, while exposing the wall then there can be traces of uh, uh, painting but now this sense is prevailing now uh, uh, slowly slowly and gradually so i think those paintings were there but those were destroyed due to uh, uh, the lack of information about this is what i would i believe so you're not worried about religious motivation to damage the paintings you're not seeing that happening no 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 that was not the case if that was the case then uh, they uh, we don't have we didn't have so much of material which was coming from them so the people foreign foreign italian or a foreign mission and all those the local people who are excavating they know what they are doing and they know what they are looking for but still if we uh, make one plus to that that they, they also need to uh, find uh, uh, these paintings i'm sure that they will find paintings so now this has, chapter has been added there is no other sentiment involved in that Thank you. Thank you. And thank you very much, Hamid, for this wonderful, as uh, Professor Richard Solomon said. I didn't know anything about the excavations going on in Punjab and also about the paintings. So it opens a new vision and new, new perspectives in studying. And also, the new, once I had a dream, this was 2002, I went to see your Prime Minister, Musharraf, and we wanted to establish a Gandharan Institute. And he was very kind to give us three hectares in Taxila. And we got some millions from Korea, but the whole project fell down because of the change of government. So I, I hope one day this would happen and there will be an institute for Gandharan studies with foreign scholars and also the Pakistanis. Thank you very much, Mohammed. Now I have the difficult task of introducing someone who doesn't need an introduction. That is, that is Richard. So everybody knows about Professor Solomon, and he, he is now the um, Emeritus Professor of Asian Languages and Literature in Seattle. He has written seven books and 150 articles. Of those things I just avoid and leave my paper. I just want to say a few things, Richard. I met you about 35 years ago. That was the time I was working in Pakistan, discovering these new thousands and thousands of coins. And at the same time, I came across these manuscripts and didn't know what to do. I don't know whether I told you this story. With the one manuscript, the photographer went to see Bailey, who was in uh, Cambridge. Uh, he was the only expert before you, apart from uh, Fusman, who could read Gandhari. So he had, I mean, thanks to all Jinnah, he had on the screen a blow up of the manuscript and started reading. Then we came across the Gilgit manuscripts and also Bamiyan and others. Uh, the contribution you made in this field is enormous, absolutely enormous. Um, I don't know if you will understand what, T, what Richard has done, apart from the seven books and more than 150 articles. It completely revolutionized our knowledge about, the, uh, the, about Gandhara, about Buddhism and new texts. And not only that, my respect for you is, Richard, uh, for, you, for forming a Sishya Parampara, you have students now who are working everywhere. I mean, like Mark Allen, who is in Sydney, Stefan Baum, who is in Munich, Jason Nilisu in Toronto, and Timothy Lenz, and many others. So this work will continue. This is what, as teachers, we expect the students to continue the work. So you have done a marvelous work. And this is my introduction to you, Richard. So please, uh, <laughs> please uh, deliver your talk. Um, 
Thank you for that uh, embarrassing <laughs> introduction. Uh, so uh, the topic uh, of my presentation is, uh, call it retrospective review. Um, basically, this is a topic which Osman suggested to me now, whenever it was several years ago, uh, when this meeting was first in the planning stage. And a lot has happened and changed since then, but I have stayed with my uh, original topic. Uh, um, so, um, my first topic is, or actually my first topic is going to be background and perspective, uh, where I talked a little bit about the special challenges and special rewards uh, and special problems and ambiguities and, and mysteries of Gandharan studies. Uh, I think I'm going to actually skip over that uh, little sermon I had prepared uh, because I have a lot of mat other material to uh, present. Uh, so maybe if there's time uh, at the end, I'll go back to that. Maybe I'll just skip it. Uh, yeah. So I'll go on to part two, which is what's new. Uh, and in this part, I just briefly introduce uh, the new materials that have come up in the last uh, 25 to 30 years in terms of uh, inscri inscriptions and manuscripts, uh, mainly. Um, and then I'll, uh, my, the next part of my presentation, I'll go into a little more detail with representative examples of these uh, new discoveries. Uh, <clears throat> so. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about inscriptions, of course, and so uh, I'm talking about Gandharan inscriptions, uh, by which I, as a matter of convenience, I define as inscriptions written in Kuroshti script and composed in Gandhari language. Um, uh, that is not quite the complete picture of all the inscriptions there are from Gandhara, but it's the strong majority. Uh, so Kuroshti and Gandhari, uh, and also occasionally there are a few examples of materials, texts in Kuroshti script, but in Sanskrit. Uh, so I also include those. So my next image, uh, this is to show you, to answer part of my question, what's new in the terms of inscriptions. Uh, some of you will recognize this. This is the title page or the, the title page on the last page of the table of contents from Stan Knuth's volume of Kuroshti inscriptions uh, in the Corpus Inscriptionum Indicarum, published in 1929, uh, so uh, almost 100 years ago. Uh, and the last page, you can see the number of inscriptions at the bottom right were 96. Uh, actually, uh, the total number of inscriptions was a little more because there are a couple of sub-numbered inscriptions. So they're really almost exactly, there were a hundred years ago, uh, I'm sorry, there are almost exactly a hundred Kuroshti inscriptions or Gandharan inscriptions as I define them were known in uh, 1929. And this book, as uh, some of you will be familiar with, was uh, something like the Bible of uh, Gandharan uh, epigraphy for many years. It no longer is and it's been superseded by, um, uh, well, in various ways, but especially by the material that's collected in the website called Gandhari.org, which I'll uh, show examples of uh, shortly. So uh, this is the, the Old Testament, uh, if you will. Uh, the, uh, so so uh, compare this 96 or really uh, about 100 inscriptions known in 1929. Uh, and this is uh, the a page from the aforementioned Gandhari.org website, and on that website there are various subparts, and this is a part which is the uh, catalog of inscriptions, uh, last page, and you can see that the total number of inscriptions has grown quite a bit since 1929, from 100 to uh, 1,175. Uh, so, uh, increase of well over 1,000%. Uh, and I, I don't have an exact number, I've never really calculated, but of those new inscriptions, 1,075 new inscriptions, uh, the large majority, I'm just guessing probably uh, at least 75% of them, probably more, were discovered within the, uh, discovered or published within the last 20 or 25 years. Uh, then, 
My second major topic is uh, Gandharan manuscripts. Uh, and again, I'm just giving this as the preliminary uh, overview of what's new. Uh, and in uh, until the period that I'm talking about, until the discoveries of the last 25 or 30 years, the total number of Gandharan manuscripts, and again, I, by that I mean manuscripts written in Kuroshti script, and in the Gandhari, or sometimes Sanskrit language, or sometimes something halfway between Gandhari and Sanskrit, what I've called uh, Gandhari hybrid Sanskrit in an article I published some years ago. Uh, anyway, that kind of manuscript, the number that were known until 1994, I think is when the first discoveries were actually made, the number that was known was a total of one. Uh, this famous Gandhari Dharmapada scroll, uh, which used to be called the Gandhari Dharmapada, now we call it the Gandhari Khotan Dharmapada because we have to uh, distinguish it from the two other examples that have been discovered since. So, uh, by a, a curious coincidence, almost exactly 100 years uh, elapsed, uh, actually 102 years elapsed, between the time when there was one Gandharan manuscript actually one Gandharan manuscript and a very few tiny scraps of others uh, were known for 102 years until 1994. The British Library uh, acquired a collection of 29 Gandharan manuscripts and that, so to speak, opened the floodgates uh, and much more is known now. This is um, one example, uh, one of the better, exa better preserved examples of a, a manuscript birch bark scroll, like nearly all of the uh, manuscripts concerned in the British Library, showing you on the left the original uh, uh, scroll as it was found inside a clay pot, and on the right is part of that scroll when it's, uh, after it was unrolled and conserved. Uh, the entire sc scroll was uh, about three, four times the length of the segment that I'm able to show you on the, on the right side of the screen. Uh, so that was, uh, uh, beach, that was the situation between uh, 1892 and 1994, uh, and this is the situation today. And so now I've gone back to the Gandhari.org website, and here, let's see, yeah. Uh, so now we're looking at the documents, uh, that is to say, a manuscript page, and the number now is. 431. Uh, that number, I hasten to add, is, is a little bit uh, misleading. There aren't 481 manuscripts like, uh, like this one that I showed you. Uh, this is a separate counting uh, calculation of all of the fragments and little bits of manuscripts of this type. So uh, many of those are probably subparts of larger manuscripts. Uh, there are a lot of uncertainties and loose, edge, uh, loose ends um, and problems of putting these uh, things back together. So the number of actual manuscripts is not 431, but it's well over 100. It might be something like 200 is a, a reasonable guess that's been proposed. So, um, so answering the first the question they raised in, in the first part, this first part of my presentation, the question was what's new, and the answer is a lot. Uh, but, uh, so then I'm going to try to uh, summarize what we have learned. Um, and again, I'm going to sub subdivide this section into inscriptions and start with that. Uh, so this is how it all started. Um, this is... Uh, uh, this is a reliquary which is now in the Metropolitan Museum, which was published by Harold Bailey, mentioned by a previous speaker, in, that should say 1978. It should not, I'm sorry, I sent the wrong <laughs> version of this. So it was just uh, published by Bailey in the Journal of the Royal Asiatic Society in 1978. And that was the first, not absolutely the first, but uh, practically the first major Gandhari inscription that kind of opened the floodgates uh, and then dozens and dozens of other inscriptions were uh, published in subsequent decades uh, beginning around 19, the end of the 1970s and going down to, uh, to today. Um, this is an, just an example, one of my personal favorites of uh, the beautiful 
uh, reliquary, this beautiful and very unusual reliquary, which was actually uh, made out of two of these uh, goblets, what they call Scythian goblets, which were supposed to be used for wine. Two silver goblets were somehow repurposed uh, into a Buddhist reliquary, which always seemed to me an interesting thing to do. And uh, although it's not very clear in this image, there are inscriptions all, uh, all over the upper section, upper section of the base and the lower section of the lid. Uh, there are actually seven different inscriptions uh, in this um, in, the, in this peculiar reliquary, and that has uh, important historical material, which I'll talk about later, time permitting. Uh, and this is another example of a very major discovery, uh, epigraphic discovery, uh, first published again by Bailey in, uh, I think, uh, 1980. A uh, very long inscription uh, with 525 words, the longest inscription. The document, the gold plate itself was lost in a very unfortunate incident of, uh, well, I won't go into that. Some of you may know the, the rumors about that. Uh, but uh, fortunately, it's fairly well uh, documented and it's historically uh, extremely important. Uh, it, since it was published by Bailey, it was republished four times after that, at least four times completely, so five editions uh, altogether, the last one by, uh, I think, by Stefan Baums in 2012. So there's been a, a gradual process of improvement in each of the five stages, had significant improvements, especially, I should uh, mention, the edition by Oscar von Hinuber, which was really made major uh, steps in our understanding of this uh, text. But I just mentioned that because to uh, remind you how, uh, uh, how these things are worked out. And uh, usually they, these inscriptions and documents have to go through several iterations of studies of study before you get a satisfactory or complete or nearly complete version. Uh, so good. Uh, and now, uh, uh, yeah, this is the uh, object in which, in which, or with, together which that uh, gold plate inscription was said to have been discovered. Not sure if that's true. Um, uh, another major discovery is the second longest Kroshti inscription, or Gandharan inscription, uh, which was published by uh, Harry Falk in, uh, I think, 2014, and uh, republished by myself last uh, two years ago. And again, an incremental state. Uh, um, process of uh, so the question is uh, what have we learned from these well lots of things and I obviously can't go into that in in great detail um, but uh, we've learned a lot about the beliefs and practices of Buddhism on the one of Gandhar and Buddhism on the one hand uh, and about um, the the dynastic history and political history, if you will, of Gandhara on the other hand. Uh, I'm going to flip back now a moment. Uh, this inscription, an inscription of Prince Indravarma and the reliquary inscription of a person named, uh, of probably the same Indravarma, uh, these belong to the dynasty which we now know as the Aprachyarajas of Bajar. Um, and the, so this is a, a dynasty that was hardly known until this new flood of inscriptions beginning in the late 1970s. There was only one inscription, the somewhat famous Shinkot reliquary. It was the only known inscription of the uh, Bajor, uh, of this Bajor or Apracha dynasty. Uh, now we have, I think at latest count, 18 inscriptions of that uh, dynasty and uh, we know that they were actually quite influential in the growth of uh, Gandharan Buddhism. Uh, so we learn a lot from these inscriptions, we learn a great deal about things we used to know very little about, uh, and we also learn about things that we knew nothing about before, uh, and uh, that includes this uh, Hela Gupta, uh, this king, a uh, previously unknown king, uh, also one of the major patrons of uh, early Buddhism in this period. Uh, this period is, I should say, early, first, early to mid-first century A.D. Uh, 
Uh, yeah. Uh, so we learn about uh, dynasties that we knew little of, and also, uh, in some cases, uh, dynasties we knew nothing about. Uh, I refer in particular to the dynasty of the uh, king, of the OD kings, King, king Saint of Arma, as in the previous description. Uh, this is another interesting dynasty in the Swat Valley, uh, previously totally unknown, now known for from three or four uh, inscriptions. Uh, uh, we've also learned a lot about the schools, what's sometimes called schools, that is Nikayas, lineage traditions of Gandharan Buddhism from these and other inscriptions. And uh, it's now pretty clear, which was not clear at all before, that uh, two lineages or two Nikayas, the Dharmaguptakas and the Sarvastivadins, were the predominant uh, dynasties of Gandharan Buddhism, at least in the early period, that is uh, the first two centuries uh, CE. Then uh, I wanted to say a few words about uh, the reconstruction of the chronology of um, Gandharan history, Gandharan dynastic history. So here I have another inscription from these Apracha, this Apracha dynasty of Bajor, uh, which, as I mentioned, we now know something like 18 inscriptions. Uh, and this one had a particularly important effect uh, because, as it happened, the inscription on the inside of the lid, so uh, you can't see the inscription here. If you open up the lid and turn it over, there's an inscription written in spiral fashion inside the lid. It's a quite unusual um, formation. Uh, and in that, there were surprisingly, almost uniquely, I think uniquely in this kind of inscription, as far as I'm aware, uh, there was a triple date. Uh, as you probably know, um, there were various different, several different dating systems running concurrently in ancient Gandhara and causing all kinds of confusion and controversy uh, among uh, historians. And here for the first time we have uh, the three, three uh, dates on one uh, inscription. Uh, so uh, the dates, let me do that sequentially and this is just for those who may know or be interested in this sort of thing. These are the Kuroshti numerals. So the first one that I've highlighted here is the year 27 of the regnal year of King Vijayamitra, also of that Aprachavaraja dynasty. And the second one is the year 73 in what's called the era of King Azes, or Ayasa, it's called in Gandhari. And the third one, which was the real bonus uh, at the top, we have the, uh, the date 120, uh, 102, uh, the signs from the right, just for those who are into Kroshti numerology. So on the right, you have that vertical, that's just the sign for one. And the next character looks like that, that's 100. Uh, there's a no first the number two, then the 100, and then a one after it. So it's two times 100 plus one makes uh, 201. So that um, gave a specific calculation for this ancient era, this old era, which had been known, but its numerical value had been uncertain. Uh, this is the old era, or some people called it the Shaka era, or some people called it the Greek era, and it was all guesswork. But once this was correlated to these two other dates, um, it became clear that the origin of that date, uh, what, that origin of that old era was actually 186, uh, 186 or 85, 185 AD. When I say it became clear, it actually became clear to me, um, but uh, it also later, it subsequently became clear to uh, Harry Falk and um, Chris, uh, Chris Bennett working together that it wasn't really 186, it was 100. And, uh, 76 slash 175. Uh, so I won't go into the details. And so there was a bit of a controversy. And I think it looks like the Falcon Bennett correlation is, is working out better. So I more or less conceded the point, but it's only a difference of 10 years. But the point is this really locked in the, uh, the controversy, locked in the interpretation, the chronology of other, many other inscriptions, which are dated in this uh, early 
uh, early era. <coughs> and uh, there are many other examples of how the chronology uh, of this, the historical chronology of uh, Gandhara in this period uh, were, um, were clarified. Uh, I'll just example one, mention one example that are probably familiar to people, uh, and that's the discovery of the previously lost or forgotten uh, Kushan king, Wima Taktu, uh, who we now know uh, intervened between Wima Katfises and Kanishka I uh, as a result of a discovery of an inscription, not really a Gandharan inscription in the, strictly speaking, in the way that I define it, because it was an inscription in uh, in Bactrian um, from Rabatak in northern Afghanistan, uh, but still within the same sphere of interest, the sphere of concern. Uh, another uh, and uh, another very big discovery that has been come out in, the, in recent decades is the uh, determination, or at least a better theory, a better interpretation of the, the, um, uh, the era of Kanishka, the Kanishka era. Uh, this, as people are probably aware, was a huge issue for uh, over a hundred years. Uh, and I went back and you know, checked the older research and writing on this, and I found out that there, were, uh, there was a conference in London in, under the auspices of the Royal Asiatic Society in 1913 when all of the historians got together to discuss what the era of Kanishka, and in the end, they all agreed to disagree, <laughs> un inconclusive. And there was another conference in London in 1960, when another new generation of uh, historians and Gandharan scholars got together to argue the date of the Kanishka era, and same thing happened, they agreed to disagree, uh, no conclusion. And then, there was a third conference in, uh, uh, in Dushanbe, in Tajikistan, oh, well, uh, I guess it was then in Soviet Union, Tajik Republic, uh, in 1968. And there, uh, the, the conference was not officially dedicated to, the, his, to that particular question, the era of Kanishka, but in fact it dominated the proceedings of that conference. And guess what happened uh, there again? There was no agreement. There was... Uh, theories that uh, Kanishka started in one in 78 AD and others put him in 125 and others put him way later uh, and on and on. Well, what happened was um, Harry Falk uh, some years ago, sorry I'm forgetting the date when he published this um, around 1990, uh, published a new interpretation of a, some chronological data given in a astrono Sanskrit astrono astronomical text, uh, and uh, the arguments are kind of complicated. I won't go into them, but uh, he made a strong argument for the origin of the Kanishka era in 127 AD. And that uh, argument has won the field um, not unanimously and not certain certainly. Uh, I don't think uh, we should say that it has been pro conclusively proven that Kanishka, Kanishka's era begins in 127 AD, uh, but there's a strong sentiment among the experts that that is uh, the best under uh, the best interpretation, the most likely explanation. So uh, I think we can consider that problem tentatively solved, if that uh, makes sense to put it that waffling way. Um, so uh, that's, uh, those are some examples of what we learned from inscriptions, and now if I have a little more time, uh, I'll give some example of what we've learned from uh, manuscripts. And here are two examples. Um, uh, the, the first is the inscription that I talked about before, uh, of, um, published by Harry Falcon. On the right is an example of one of the new inscriptions that have been discovered. Sorry. Um, so uh, I have a couple of examples of uh, kind of summaries of the new manuscript materials. And as I mentioned before, there are hundreds of fragments and maybe, maybe 200 uh, individual uh, 
manuscripts in total. Uh, so this is what it looked like in uh, 2014, uh, published by Harry Falk and Ingo Strauch, uh, who were major players in the Gondari manuscript uh, game, if you will. Uh, and uh, so this was a summary of the manuscripts and the genres represented uh, according to uh, their work in 1914. Um, and I have uh, another, uh, so yeah, with a, a total of, uh, I can't read, 100, about 133 manuscripts. Uh, that number has grown since then. There have been further discoveries, uh, a couple of which I'll mention. A bit. Uh, and this is another example of how the material has been summarized. Uh, this is the table of contents of a uh, book I published uh, three, uh, three years ago. Uh, and this is not meant to be a summary the way the previous image was. Uh, this is a select representative selection of the, uh, some of the better preserved and more comprehensible uh, texts that I was able to cobble together some, some sort of translation for. Um, uh, and uh, here is uh, one, one example of the Dharmapada. I mentioned this before. Uh, previously, until all this stuff happened, there was one manuscript of the Dharmapada that I showed earlier. That is the Khotan manuscript from 1892. Uh, and since then, two more manuscripts uh, have been discovered of the Dharmapada or of closely related texts. Uh, one published by Tim Lenz, who uh, Osman mentioned, uh, and the other published by Harry Falk, whom I mentioned. These are the names that keep coming up. Um, so we now have three examples of the Dharmapada or cognate texts in Gandhari, uh, and that's the only example of a single text that we have three exemplars of. Uh, there's one other, the Anavatapta which I showed early on, uh, and we have two uh, representatives of that. Uh, so this is beginning, beginning to, we're beginning to get numbers that are significant enough to give us some uh, idea about the popularity of certain texts. And, and this is nothing surprising. I mean, everybody knows Dhammapada or Dhammapada or Udana Varga, the Sanskrit term, that that's sort of Buddhism 101 in uh, I think in modern, among modern Western scholars uh, or Western readers, that's sort of where you tend to start. Uh, and I, I think pretty clearly that's how they started in Buddhist monasteries in, in Gandhara and in Central Asia, uh, where we get many, many manuscripts of these texts in later manuscripts in Sanskrit. So we're getting sort of a picture of the, the literature and even of the uh, the procedure, the educational system. Uh, this is another uh, brand new thing, which was not uh, in, this is part of a, a new collection, a large new m miscellaneous collection of manuscripts, which Mark Allen uh, brought to light uh, and is studying and uh, is sharing with uh, his, his colleagues. Uh, and, and this is a particularly interesting uh, manuscript of a, a, a very long um, scroll. Uh, this is, as it says, partial image. The whole thing is maybe three times uh, what you've seen, what you see here. Uh, and it's a terrible mess. Um, it's all broken up into pieces and it was mishandled at, very, at, certain, at a certain stage. So these bits and pieces are uh, uh, not in the correct order, which is very frustrating when I think of Osman's a presentation yesterday uh, about the order of se the sequence of uh, events or of episodes in the Buddha's uh, in uh, the life of the, the Buddha or the Bodhisattva, as it is seen in in Gandharan sculpture uh, stupa um, friezes, and as it's shown in uh, and as they're presented in different manuscripts. Uh, well, we'd certainly like to know the order in this manuscript and how it corresponds or doesn't correspond to, uh, to the uh, representations, visual representations. Uh, but we can't 
uh, rely on the order of, uh, uh, of the fragments as it's shown here. So it's, it's a mess I'm dealing with, I'm working on it, uh, trying to put these things together in their proper order. Uh, the problem is, uh, I don't know if anybody's had the experience of working with old birch bark, and I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. It, it's terrible stuff because when, when those pieces break apart, they don't break cleanly. The, the, it's extremely brittle, so you, you don't, you can't just, well, sometimes, if you're lucky, you can line up the edges and say, okay, these two fit together, but in most cases, you can't, because the intermediate the edges have chipped away, um, but there are other tricks, so uh, some progress is being made. So this is a, a biography, which I'm pretty, as far as I've been able to determine, it's completely different from all the known biographies, the ones that Osman told us a lot about yesterday. Um, uh, unless there is some, uh, some translation of it lurking somewhere in Chinese, uh, but I don't think there is. Uh, so it's just a, a biography uh, that's uh, totally independent. Uh, and it's recognizable, but uh, the recognizable theme and, and episodes that everybody's familiar with. Uh, but there are also some rather surprising peculiarities, and I, I just uh, picked one where this is near near the end of the manuscript, or I should say the apparent end of the manuscript, uh, and it talks about the, uh, the 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 noble the four noble truths, the Arya Satyani, uh, or three of them, uh, and rather surprisingly, it the the presentation it's the first one Ayadukha, the second one Ayadukha Hidu, and then number four the Magga, the Marga. Uh, so this is quite weird. Uh, and I'm not suggesting that this is that this text represented a wholly, completely different kind of Buddhism with different uh, four four truths. Um, uh, that's not what it means. I'm not sure what it means, but it's just very interesting to see this is a very independent presentation of what is essentially the uh, the normal. Uh, familiar biography of the Buddha. So this is unpublished. I, I have an article coming out uh, late, not this year, but it'll be next year in the uh, Jayab's Journal of the um, um, International Association of Buddhist Studies, uh, where I, I don't have a full edition of this text, but I give some uh, preliminary samples like the ones here. And uh, I'm working on, uh, with my colleagues working on reconstructing the whole thing, but that's going to take a while, I assure you. The last topic is synthesis, how inscriptions and manuscripts illuminate each other. So there are some cases, only a few, a handful, where we can actually correlate the inscriptional data and the data from these manuscripts. Um, and that's uh, quite exciting because that sort of thing doesn't usually happen in our field. So this is a synthesis. Uh, one example, the first one that was known, this came up immediately in the early study of the uh, British Library uh, manuscripts in 1995. This one kind of jumped out at me. So this is a, a, a familiar, to some of you it would be familiar character whom we knew previously only from coins and from one minor reference in one inscription. Uh, this is Jehanika or Zeonysis, as he's known in, uh, in uh, Greek, on his, on his coin legends uh, from the early first century uh, AD. And this is a manuscript, unfortunately, rather fragmentary manuscript from one of the Avadana sets, sets of Avadanas in the British Library, Gandhari manuscripts. And uh, right there in the second uh, line, it talks about Jihanige Mahakshatrapa, so uh, Mahakshatrapa, great satrap, uh, Jihanika. So we have a uh, some uh, correspondence, not a very illuminating one, but uh, interesting between the manuscripts and the inscriptions. Uh, we have a couple of other examples. I'll, I'll show you. I think I have. I can show you two, which are more uh, illuminating. Uh, this is a Sanskrit fragment from Bamiyan. So, strictly speaking, this is not, doesn't fall into the uh, definition of Gandhar and inscriptions that I stated at the beginning of my presentation, um, that they're in 
Kuroshti script and Gandhari, uh, Kuroshti script and Gandhari language. Well, this is a slightly later uh, manifestation, uh, and it's in Sanskrit and in Brahmi script from about the fourth century. Um, but this is a, a, a clearly in the tradition of uh, Gandharan uh, texts uh, from a later period. Uh, this is part of the Bamiyan uh, manuscript group, which you might be familiar with. Um, that's a, a, a collection uh, that's sometimes referred to as a Skoyan collection, uh, but it's also scattered in different places. The majority of it in, is in the Skoyan collection in, uh, in Norway. Uh, thousands and thousands of manuscript fragments, most of them in, uh, in Brahmi, like this one, some of them also in, uh, in Kuroshti. Uh, but this one jumped out at me uh, when I had occasion to look at those manuscripts now, I don't know how many years ago, quite a while. Um, and uh, that what jumped out at me is at the end of second line, it says, Huveshko. Uh, which is certainly uh, the Kushana king Huvishka, the succeeder of uh, successor to Kanishka the first. So we're talking about the middle to latter half of the second century uh, A.D. Uh, so even though this isn't strictly a Gandharan Gandhari uh, manuscript, it's referring to the uh, period applying to or retro retrospectively describing the period that uh, we're concerned with. Um, and the second line, the whole second line reads, it, well, it's broken off at the left. The surviving part says, Yana samprastito huveshko nama. Uh, and so the reconstruction there, I think, is obvious. And I, I think everybody uh, accepts that when you have Yana prastita, it must mean Mahayana samprastita, common uh, expression. So this shows, prove that wealth at least superficially, that Huvishka was a follower of the Mahayana, and that the Mahayana was present and prominent in 2nd century uh, AD Gandhara. I refer again to Osman's uh, comments earlier. Uh, strictly speaking, it doesn't really prove that. It proves that in the 4th century that he was thought to have been a, uh, a, a adherent of the Mahayana. And, well, the implications of that I won't go into. That's been discussed in uh, various places, um, just to give you a general idea. And the third and last example uh, is a thing called the monastic ledger document. So this is also brand new. Uh, it was published by Mark Allen in uh, Jayab's, uh, I think, last year, uh, or maybe two years ago already. Um, and it's a really remarkable uh, document. Um, it is, as uh, my label here says, it is, as Mark has deduced, I think certainly correctly, a record of donations, actually the record book of donations to a Gandharan, an unfortunately unknown Gandharan uh, monastery. And uh, the part that's particularly interesting here, I've marked out in, um, in red, and I've given the... Uh, transcription of the second line, which is Swaya, uh, reconstructed Swaya Balasa Maharaja Sagrema Katif Katissa, etc. Um, well, uh, this is the titles like Swayambala, he who is his own army. Uh, these are very characteristically Kushana uh, uh, titles, which we know from, again, from coins and inscriptions. Um, and then the question is, who is Grema Katafsa? Um, well, uh, I've given you here the answer, which is equals Rama Vima Katfises, and this is based on Mark's work. Uh, that may seem a little strange. Uh, the correspondence between Grema and Vima is weird from uh, an Indian point of view, but uh, with philological ledger domain, if I may use the term, um, it actually with reference to uh, changes in uh, phonetic changes that are documented in the Iranian languages, uh, it's pretty convincingly, I think it's been agreed, I haven't heard anyone disagreeing with Mark's conclusion that this is actually um, the record of donations to Monastery X, unfortunately unknown, by King William Kadfisi. And that's something new because William Kadfisi was not previously known as a um, 
uh, a patron of uh, Buddhism. Uh, on his image, on his coins, he typically has the reverse image of Shiva, or I should say pseudo Shiva, because it's not clear that this is actually the Hindu Shiva as such. But uh, we never thought of Vima Confucius in, in a connection with patronage of uh, Buddhism before. We just happen not to have the uh, uh, the evidence for it. But now it becomes clear that he was very important to this unfortunately unknown uh, manuscript. So uh, I'll now turn to my last concluding comments. Uh, so yeah, I, I've uh, restricted myself to a discussion of inscription and manuscripts, uh, mostly because that's what uh, Osmond originally asked me to um, discuss and because that's my uh, my comfort zone uh, but I just want to at least mention or give a hat a tip of a hat to the other uh, fields that are uh, involved and that have been enriched in recent years by um, uh, by these uh, discoveries uh, one example that um, comes to my mind is the uh, field archaeological uh, progress uh, which has been mentioned particularly by Hamid. Uh, wonderful things that have been done by archaeologists, uh, Pakistani, Afghan, and their collaborators from Japan and Italy and France and lots of other places. Um, and uh, this is one example that uh, is particularly of interest to me anyway, the uh, incredible discoveries at Dar Dairy, which uh, we saw a little Hamid showed us a little bit of, uh, and then the reconstruction of, of the pieces uh, should back up. So this, these were uh, parts of stupa decorations, which were in a, apparently an unused cell, a storage unit. Uh, we don't know exactly why, or I don't know exactly why that, uh, that stupa was disassembled and parked in this cell, but it's very fortunate that it was because that means that it survived intact. And then uh, by uh, some other tricks of the trade, it was possible to completely act and confidently reconstruct those pieces into their original position. Uh, there are, do I have a, is there a pointer in this? Yes, on the top. Yeah. Uh, because uh, these pieces, these panels all have these uh, little uh, Kuroshti aksharas, uh, Kuroshti syllables. Uh, you, don't, you can't see them very clearly, but they're here and here. Uh, and then uh, those can be lined up with the Kuroshti alphabet. It's called the Arapachana. It's not like the regular Indian alphabet, but it's an um, uh, alphabet peculiar to, to the Kuroshti script. Uh, but anyway, you can line these things up in the orders of, of Arapachana uh, and uh, so uh, the, these uh, panels were completely uh, reconstru confidently reconstructed as they originally stood. So uh, I like that as an example of uh, how epigraphic studies and linguistic studies can be teamed up with field archaeology. And I, I worked with Koizumi-san, who uh, published all of these things. Uh, on, I worked with him together in Japan back in 2000-something, um, and it was uh, one of the very satisfying collaborate, uh, interdisciplinary collaborations that the administration was telling us to do, and sometimes it really works. Uh, and I want to mention one final point, uh, which I haven't talked about, but in terms of the, the nitty-gritty of language and linguistics, uh, and also paleography, uh, what has been learned from all of this is, is quite huge. I haven't gone into that because that's not my assignment, um, but I thought I uh, should mention it. And so once again, uh, I turn back to the Gandhari.org website, and this is from the Dictionary of Gandhari section. Um, probably you know there never was a dictionary bef of Gandhari before. Now there is, and it's very much of the modern uh, kind. Uh, and this has been the work, uh, I want to mention, um, really heroic work by uh, Stefan Baums and Andrew Glass, and I'm proud to say that both of them are, uh, are um, my former students. 
uh, Andrew is now in the public sphere, but uh, behind the scenes, he's uh, working, uh, doing a lot of the uh, important work on this. So this just shows you the, well, so unfortunately it's off the edge of the screen, uh, but it, yeah, you can see in the left-hand column, uh, this is the amount, gives you some idea of the amount of material uh, that's now uh, known to us and documented in this uh, dictionary. So that's, um, I think, have I said enough? Yeah, I've definitely <laughs> said enough. Uh, I hope I've given you a, a general picture of what's going on in Gandhar and uh, uh, textual studies. Thanks. Greek errors of the Greek error of 201, by my math, that turned into 174 BC. Is there something at the beginning of a particular king's rule or something that you can key into that date of 174? It's like if it was 312, it would be the Seleucid era. Yeah. What happened in 174 that that is the start yeah. of the Greek era? Well, that's complicated, and I don't know. I don't know if it's um, if I remember all the details offhand. Uh, what happened is that uh, Harry Falk and Chris Bennett recalculated my interpretation, and it ties in with uh, another inscription, which is dated in an intercalary month. And this was discovered really brilliantly by Gerard Fussman, that there's this word, yambulima, in the Gandharan. And yambulima means nothing in any uh, Indian language. Um, and he realized that that's actually just a loan word from Greek, I think, embolimos, which means intercalary. So, and then working back from then, uh, Falk and Bennett worked out that the 186, the proposed, my proposed date was uh, the month in question, Gorpaios, was not a, um, uh, was not uh, intercalated in that year, but in 175, I'm not, 176, it was intercalary. So that's why their argument is uh, probably stronger uh, than mine. And what really happened then uh, is a different question. I'm sorry. I, dancing around your question. Um, and what Falcon Bennett interpreted these things as sort of reincarnations of the old Seleucid era, which uh, the Hellenistic era, which began in, uh, sorry, I think 312, 312 BC. Yeah. Uh, and they interpreted that as uh, a, a new incarnation of that Seleucid era. I don't recall that that was mentioned by them. But, you know, there's an article in uh, by uh, Falcon Bennett in Acta Orientalia, um, the the Denmark, uh, the, the Scandinavian Acta Orientalia, in I don't remember the year, but I can give you the reference. Uh, so the problem is, my interpretation uh, was based on the correlation to the Aze's era, and then. It, it is usually thought that the Aze's era, that is the second date in this inscription, uh, the year 73, is the same as the Vikrama era, or what turned into the Vikrama era, which is still current today in some parts of India, which began in 58 BC, I think. Um, so it was believed by most people that the Aze's era is the Vikrama era, so then based on Aze's era beginning 57 BC, that's how I calculate then that, um, uh, that uh, the, um, the so-called Greek year began in, in 2001, in 201. But Falcon Bennett's theory on the basis of the calculation when the intercalary month uh, then spoils the very neat equation of the Vikrama era and the Aze's era, and they didn't really explain it. Uh, so then you're left, well, when the, what is the, the Aze's era and what is the Vikrama era? Uh, so in clarifying one point, another clear point got un made unclear. So that's why it gets, I'm sorry, it gets fairly technical, but that's why I uh, was a little hesitant and I said Falcon Bennett's theory is quite convincing, but it's not uh, locked in. 
uh, because it, it creates a problem of its own. So, gray area. I was going to say, you show a little piece of bird talk when we're talking about how problematic it is to kind of put them all together. Can, can you use artificial intelligence in any way to uh, kind of speed up the process? Or kind of um, yeah. This has been mentioned uh, in, in connection with these things, but uh, I'm not sure that artificial intelligence can, uh, can f I mean, I, I know you can use it to fit together, you know, if you have a, a archaeological jigsaw puzzle and it can simplify the, uh, the reassembly of the little bits, but I, I'm doubtful whether when the bits are not discont when they're not contiguous, when the borders are lost, um, I, I would be surprised if they can do it. Uh, this is, I, I don't touch that stuff, uh, the um, Mark Allen and his collaborators, Mark Allen and Ian McCrabb, whom we're going to hear tomorrow, I hope, uh, are, uh, Mark, Ian McCrabb is a, a serious techie and uh, Andrew Glass on the, on the U.S. side. Uh, I leave all those questions to them uh, so, and, and that hasn't been mentioned as far as I know. It gives me great pleasure to um, introduce Serena Altiero. Uh, she's an archaeologist and historian. She specializes in global studies, transcultural contexts, and Silk Road studies. Her research is particularly focused on the outputs of in, uh, transregional and transcultural contexts in South Asia and bordering areas. Before joining the Ceres, she worked at Sun Yat-sen University in Guangzhou as a researcher in Buddhist archaeology and Buddhist social history. She previously earned a research fellowship from UNESCO India and worked as assistant professor in art history at the Princess Noura bint Abdul Rahman University of Riyadh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. She completed her PhD in 2012 at the Sapienza University of Rome with the thesis Cultural and Trade Contact in the Western Indian Ocean according to historical, literary, epigraphical, numismatic, archaeological, and art historical data from the 3rd century BC to the 5th century AD. She's been part of the Italian archaeological mission in Nepal and participated uh, in the Italian archaeological mission in the Swat Valley in Pakistan. From 2007 to 2014, she worked as an external collaborator for the National Museum of Oriental Art, Giuseppe Tucci, now Museum of Civilizations in Rome. Serena Altiero is a member of ISMEO and other international professional associations. She took part in several international conferences and has a long record of lectures in prestigious venues around the world. She recently edited the volume Globalization and Transculturality from antiquity to the pre-modern world. Over her career, she published several peer-reviewed papers in international academic journals and collective volumes. Uh, and today, she's going to talk about new perspectives at the crossroads of art history, archaeology, and conservation. Please help me welcome Serena Ojeda. Thank you, first of all, for you being here and to the organizer for this very interesting uh, meeting and also because it's the first one after the pandemic, so it's, it's everything very exciting. Um, first of all, uh, I just want to uh, draw your attention to um, the title of my presentation, it's about digital Gandhara and digitizing Gandhara. Uh, you can follow our activities on Twitter, the handle is there. Um, and I will try to focus today on highlighting how digitization uh, can lead to new perspective for Gandhara studies uh, and helping not only uh, recording and cataloging, uh, but also research, conservation, and uh, uh, open up to 
actually new research on the topic. Uh, this is, uh, well, our project DIGA is short for Digitization of, Ganda of Gandharan Artifacts. Uh, and it's a relatively new project because it only started early, earlier this year in February, even if it has a quite long history with some previous projects preparing to it. Uh, we're based at Rural University of Bochum uh, in Center for Religious Studies. Uh, we have um, several partners. The most prominent partners are the, um, uh, the Directorate of Archaeology um, of Quebec Pantutu, uh, Pakistan, uh, the University uh, Library of Heidelberg, and the ISMEO. Uh, that has been especially precious uh, very recently when we had the first field work. My colleagues just came back from Pakistan 10 days ago or something like that. Uh, I want to start just introducing the project um, with some of the main features. But first of all, who uh, is working on it? This is our team. Uh, I just wanted to introduce the team because um, it's an example of synergy between different specialization. Uh, there are archaeologists in there, like me and Cristiano Muscatelli. Uh, there's Jesse Pons, that is an art historian. And then we have uh, Frederick Helbert, that is our specialist of digital humanities. Um, and uh, finally, we have Sarah Rotter, that is our student assistant. Um, so it's only thanks to this synergy that we can actually, uh, we can already see some results I will show you later and uh, you will see how uh, actually uh, this synergy can work. But uh, the next question would be what are we digitizing? Uh, the materials that are uh, at first uh, object of our project are uh, almost 2,000 Buddhist sculpture in stucco and uh, stone. Uh, mostly statues, relief, and decorated elements uh, that are now stored uh, in two collections. Uh, one is the collection of the Dir Museum Chakdara, and uh, the other one is a small collection that is in the Italian archaeological mission uh, in Pakistan, in the mission house. Uh, and after the digitization, it will be uh, finally stored in the Sbat Museum, where also uh, a larger collection is still uh, is already there. Um, why these collections are so uh, peculiar and important? Uh, mostly it's because they're from excavations. They're from archaeological excavation conducted by the KP Department of Archaeology and Museum, uh, and the Department of Archaeology of the University of Peshawar, and the Italian Archaeological Mission in Pakistan. Uh, so, as we already know, having uh, a Gandharan, co Gandharan collection that are precisely uh, provenanced and uh, scientifically uh, recorded, uh, it's um, quite a plus for our study. Uh, continuing with the question, what are we digitizing? Just to show you where we are, uh, mostly this is the, the one of the main sites, that is Chatpat. Um, I'm sorry. And uh, you can see highlighted in this uh, map uh, the area where most of the sites whose, uh, whose materials are now in the Chakdara Museum came from. Um, but why we need to digitize this material and what, and what can digitization add? Um, in general, um, DIGA aims at digitizing unaccessible materials. Um, how we determine what is unaccessible? Uh, this quality is determined by uh, both physical unaccessibility uh, and by the fact that most largely these things, these objects, are unpublished. Uh, but as I told you, they are documented mostly. Um, we have uh, museum registries with uh, uh, the main infos, and then there will be the info we're going to add. Um, our uh, research cluster questions um, mostly are around uh, three main topics. Uh, one is the identifications of workshops and production centers. 
Um, we can summarize our questions as I have my uh, notes here. Um, can correlations be observed uh, between the formal and iconographical variation and the geographical distribution of the subject? Uh, can different levels of plastic expression be identified and to which extent are these letting um, at this telling of the existence of workshops, production centers, solistic zones and uh, schools. Uh, then another uh, of our research question or set of research questions is um, about the inner logic of the schools. Uh, can a pattern of exchange be observed between workshops? Uh, which places are engaged in the import-export of models? Um, and how and what is this telling about significance of Buddhist centers? The last cluster of questions revolves around the history of Buddhism in, in Gandhara. Um, looking at the peculiarities of illustration of a geography of the Buddha, um, what can we identify and how are these peculiarities distributed both from a geographical point of view and as of the uh, quantity um, of attestations. Uh, then another important point of research is uh, looking at the relation with literary account uh, and sectarian affiliations. And then another question would be about uh, the geographical logic in the differentiation of the iconography of bodhisattvas and the depiction of Buddhist paradise. So where, uh, if depiction of bodhisattvas are particularly related with particular places. Um, and so this discourse, these questions can in a way uh, corroborate and be corroborated by written sources and related to the emergence of Mahayana. Um, besides our uh, research questions, um, I also would like to point out some of the scientific desiderata that we have uh, from this project before looking at some also uh, more technical feature of our work. Um, our scientific desiderata can be uh, um, summarized and uh, trying to give visibility to uh, a multiplicity of Gandharan styles, uh, trying to map uh, formal and iconographic variation uh, in the collections, and finally to reassess the visual material uh, in the light of uh, other type of sources such as manuscript or uh, inscription. After this uh, quite long introduction, uh, I would like to focus on how we are digitizing and our digital concept. Um, mostly, and this is something uh, that we can we see can also be in a way problematic, but it is something I will return on later. Um, our digitization will be uh, will lead to have um, a final database that will be released in open access, uh, with open licenses, and with uh, agreement for long-term access and renovation of the uh, supports in, in case of need. Um, and the decision is made uh, following established uh, standards. Uh, and aiming at interoperability. This means that one of, one of the problems with uh, using archaeological database, for example, is always been that they are very site-specific and uh, project-specific. Um, we're trying, we will use uh, tools and uh, methodologies that aim at, at uh, complete interoperability of the data. So uh, the idea is adding sets of data that are very, very easy and simple to transfer and to use on different platforms and by different uh, scholars. Uh, the data um, will be organized in new uh, resources. 
uh, we're already in a quite advanced state for the uh, preparation of the thesaurus. Uh, we have a list of different uh, vocabulary, standardized vocabulary for the description of the objects. Um, and then uh, also uh, sites are collected in a gazetteer. Um, and this is only possible thanks to uh, basing our uh, building our work on what has already been done by a long tradition of Gandhara studies and through collaboration with other projects. Um, besides the data, so descriptions and vocabularies uh, on this object, of course we also uh, will deal with um, images. Uh, so the digitization will be obtained through uh, high resolution photography uh, there's already been uh, a first uh, field work that just finished, as I told you, and already uh, almost 750 uh, objects have already been uh, digitized through photography. Uh, and now we will start to select among these objects also those who will uh, undergo 3D digitization, and this is something that will be done in, a, in one of our next uh, field works. Um, so, um, these are most of um, just a conclusion about how we are digitizing. So, it will be in open access, um, a long term storage will be guaranteed, and um, we will, uh, all the work will be. Uh, deeply interlinked with uh, broader research with the broader research environment, um, and we will try, we will also provide some technical feature like uh, creating geospacing functions and annotation tools. Uh, what you see in the image is only a, a project. Um, uh, example, so uh, we don't really know if it will uh, look exactly like this, but this is the idea behind the, uh, the project uh, itself. Um, as I mentioned, there are uh, many uh, already existing databases in the region that often do not communicate to each other. Uh, so we are trying to, we will, we already have uh, an, an open an operational network that we are working toward expanding um, so that uh, data will be um, interlinked uh, and available to a larger audience. Um, as you saw already, our team is uh, unites different specialization and this is also extended uh, to our network that uh, aims at connecting uh, art historians, archaeologists, philologists, historians, museum curators, and digital humanists. Um, uh, the idea is to develop, uh, and this is what we're working toward already, uh, best practices to uh, publish and um, connect uh, sources on uh, Gandharan Buddhism. Uh, promoting interoperability and uh, facilitate and enable cooperation uh, in order to promote uh, further developments in uh, in the study of Gandharan Buddhism and uh, Gandharan art. Um, let's go back to uh, a question that we that I already asked and also try to answer that is what are we digitizing so we have images in 2d or 3d uh, we have the metadata so all the uh, information about the objects and we have annotation so uh, scenes uh, what's on an object not only the formal but also the um, the contents um, among our um, strong points, our uh, strong goals, uh, there are these uh, data link between each other. So, uh, link open data methodologies using to obtain uh, vocabularies and 
uh, tools uh, that aim at the data, uh, the standardization of the data. Uh, how we can do that? Um, mostly, um, we created uh, vocabularies uh, that are uh, specific to different topics like places, motives, narratives, persons. Um, and it all started uh, integrating uh, sources already available, uh, such as discipline-specific vocabulary, for example, the repertorio terminologico that we will uh, discuss uh, further later, um, and also uh, standards established by the international art history community, like the Art and Architecture Tesaurus of the Getty Institute, or Iconoclast. And uh, in order to make these, um, uh, these vocabularies and the thesaurus itself um, accessible and transmissible, uh, every entry is attributed a permanent identifier that is called an URI. But uh, besides all the theory, uh, I want to also show you uh, one of the first outputs we have, that is the thesaurus. So I will uh, walk you through the process that lead to what we have now. Uh, the thesaurus is a new resource for the standardization of Gandharan studies. Um, and is built around um, a core that um, comes from previous studies. So how uh, did we uh, did we feed it? Um, mostly based on the sources you see in this uh, diagram here. Uh, I must say that among the catalog we consulted um, as a specific like a the third uh, a specific mention the Gandharan sculptors in the Peshawar Museum, so the catalog of the museum in Peshawar, whose orga in internal organization um, is uh, particularly precise and uh, adapt to be um, also converted in a, in a digital language. Uh, but the first step we had, and from where we started, uh, and this is the practical example I want to show you, is the um, repertorio terminologico uh, edited by Domenico Faccena and Anna Filigenzi. Uh, that has been mostly a starting point to uh, feed the vocabulary. Uh, the repertorio uh, is uh, a printed book um, that aims at giving uh, a list of terms used to catalog. Uh, so it's a first attempt at standardization of cataloging Gandharan art. Um, but as I say, it's a printed book. What did we do? First of all, we had to uh, digitize it, to put it into the digital world. And we used a set of tools um, for example, Transcribus, that is uh, a tool for OCR, that is Optical Character Recognition, uh, is a tool that has been um, invented mostly to work on manuscript, but it also has uh, sets of um, useful to uh, read uh, and digitize uh, printed books, and this is what we use for the, um, for the thesaurus. Um, and this let us to have the uh, so, of uh, sentences and entries. Uh, yeah, I think it's this one. Yeah, here you can see from the text we obtain the different lines in which the text is um, is divided, and it, it also uh, gives thanks to the work of Frederick Calvert, that is our digital humanist, um, to uh, maintain the, a sort of the uh, structure that needed to be uh, further worked manually, but we had a strong uh, starting point. Uh, in order to reorganize the different sectors, you can see here is a bit small, but here we have the architecture, 
we have a ceremonial object, um, everyday object, fauna, flora, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, we use another tool that is Bok Bench uh, that uh, is used to create um, a, a SCOS vocabulary. A SCOS is a simple knowledge organization system. And uh, this is how we uh, managed to uh, convert uh, a written so uh, printed source like the, uh, the repertorio into a digital tool. Uh, because it's not simply translating something from language to another, but you have actually to, inter actually to interpret it because uh, the um, the way you use it completely different. For example, uh, using the in the in the printed form, you can have an approach that is uh, from um, from like a top to bottom um, approach, uh, while um, it, in in the translation in the complete in the transformation into digital, uh, we start from the details to read the general. So we had to completely uh, um, uh, revolt some of the of the entries. Especially this is true for uh, the um, people um, sector here. That was one of the most challenging to treat. Uh, and uh, the architectural elements. Uh, yeah, here you, you can see an example of how a concept appears. Um, uh, every concept has labels and alternative labels so that it can be identified um, in different ways. Uh, you, mm, Maybe in this slide, I, I really cannot see what is visible or not, but most of the concepts have, for example, diacritics, but they are readable if you look, go into the search uh, function. You can find it also without diacritics. So it um, uh, allows um, different kinds of spelling, and also with the use of alternative labels, it is also uh, made better. So uh, starting from the repertorio, then we had to add uh, vocabularies to, um, to feed into the Digatesaurus. And uh, we simply started listing uh, some uh, short strings that could identify scenes and narratives uh, and put them in a hierarchy that could then be, uh, that will be soon uh, also uh, transformed in uh, its cost using the bulk badge instruments I just showed you. Uh, so we have vocabulary with scenes and narratives and another vocabulary with figures um, that are mostly the characters that appear in the narratives. Um, of course this is not something uh, that is finished but uh, the agility of such tools is that you can keep feeding it with not only sources that we already have, but uh, what we aim at doing is feeding it with all the new data from the digitization of the Chakdara material. Uh, and uh, the, the SCOS vocabulary, our thesaurus, it's already partially online. We are still uh, correcting something, but it's already there in the Cosmos page of um, our university uh, repository. Um, to conclude the, let's say, technical presentation of the aspects of this project, I wanted to lead your attention to the fact, again, that we had our fieldwork. So these are our, some pictures from uh, what was done. We had two uh, photographic teams. Uh, and two uh, cataloging teams working at the same time, and in uh, the the field work lasted three weeks in total, and we had this amazing result of having almost 800 uh, objects already uh, cataloged. So we are very confident that with the three field work we will finish the uh, this first uh, task. 
part of the fieldwork has also been a training program for the staff of the Directorate of Archaeology in which we uh, thought uh, among the participants there were some of the PhD that uh, Hamid mentioned before. Um, uh, we gave a training on digitization, on creating um, uh, metadata for uh, the object in the museums and also on photography, also with a, uh, an attention to emergency photography, so trying to have uh, the best possible with the less uh, for example, when you end up having only your mobile with you, or you can using the professional uh, uh, modality of your mobile obtain usable uh, pictures. And this is in general uh, uh, the work we did so far uh, from a technical point of view. Uh, but um, our project looks at the um, at the future um, to guarantee longevity of the result the database will be hosted in HIDICON that is an online database of the University Library of Heidelberg uh, it's an already existing um, database that um, where we will add it's already there actually the vocabulary. So if you uh, go in there, uh, in, the, uh, in the menu, there are several uh, vocabularies from different projects and also the, the vocabulary for the digitization of Gandharan artifact will appear there so that the object can be added using it uh, as a control vocabulary. Um, this is more or less how uh, a file uh, would appear for, um, for a Gandharan relief, for example. Um, and uh, the good thing about having this kind of um, database is that it can actually set up a network of communication. Let's see an example. Uh, starting from the page I just show you, uh, it will be connected to the Gandhari.org project. So if there, um, if there are references in uh, Gandhari literature, uh, it will be uh, directly clickable from the, from the database and also the other way around. They will be interconnected. The same thing will happen for ex with the um, uh, Jataka stories, uh, the project of the University of Edinburgh. Um, so uh, the object will be connected also to uh, stories about the, uh, the Jataka itself. Uh, so if you just go on Google, for example, run a research uh, tool um, looking for previous birth or a Jataka in particular, uh, you can be addressed to one of the interconnected sources and from each of them be readdressed to the other so that one can have actually a holistic view of um, the object of that research. Uh, so there's the opportunity to query on mul multiple databases, uh, the possibility of harvesting metadata um, regardless of the language used, the media, if it's text or image, and the data can be exported and indexed uh, as necessary. Um, so what are the perspectives and possibilities? For what we saw so far, uh, first of all, um, digitizing allows us to give better answers to our questions because it allows us to uh, more quickly interconnect sources and have access to sources. Uh, provides more comprehensive data because of accessibility according to what, we, what I said before, accessibility for physically inaccessible um, uh, material or um, simply unpublished material and qu 
studies will give uh, results more complete because you directly will have uh, links to the different resources, ex existing resources. And this can, of course, lead to uh, facilitate new identification because uh, using the um, uh, descriptors, the, the small string identifying, for example, narratives, uh, this can uh, interconnect to other facets, even unidentified relief that maybe have a specific um, element that has been connected to a specific narrative. Um, the last part of my presentation, uh, it's about the benefits of digitization in, um, in Gandharan studies. Um, I summarized here the, the main uh, clusters of, uh, of benefits. Uh, the first relating to art history, issues of uh, decoloniality, and um, a focus on the risks that digitization can have that we don't have to, uh, to forget. Um, the digitized corpus allow us to answer important questions for art historical research anew. Um, we already have some uh, new infos that uh, complement uh, some of the work already done, especially the work done by Jesse Pons. Um, in if we look at these uh, slides, um, we already can look for some answers to uh, some driving questions uh, about what cultural languages can be identified uh, in the um, in the Svat Valley. Uh, if uh, these languages tell us of the existence of isolated workshops or if larger production centers can be identified. Uh, and again, uh, if patterns of exchange can be observed uh, between different sites, so different workshops and different areas of production. Um, and how uh, this exchange can tell of uh, dynamics of production. Um, from a preliminary observation of the corpus that has been looked at only a few weeks ago uh, and has been compiled so far, already we have uh, some new light on the connection between sites in the Shakot um, Talash zone and uh, those in the uh, John Bill Sidewood zone. These are the two zones, here and here. Okay. Uh, and also of these zones to the uh, Peshawar Basin, for example. But let's go um, slowly about this. So um, the assessment made during the um, recent field work uh, complements and confirms um, uh, the study made by Jesse Pons on the identification and characterization of styles across Gandhara. Uh, in fact, some of the tendencies that she observed on account of the few published sculpture that were just around 100, if I'm not wrong, uh, have been confirmed by uh, the eight, almost 800 uh, sculpture documented during the first campaign. Um, in this slide, there's a, some preview. Uh, first of all, we have these sculptures that correspond to a kind of an endemic style in the area of Chatpat. Uh, it's a series of stages of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas that have specific uh, stylistic features such as uh, squat proportions, um, the faces are quite rectangular in shape, um, the eyelids are quite straight, and 
the lips are very thin and uh, contracted in a way. And this points to a local uh, production because there's a specific concentration of this kind of figure here that uh, uh, distinguishes themselves strongly from uh, the uh, idea of classicism that we have with uh, Gandhara. Uh, then there's a group of um, reliefs, like this one, again from Chapat, uh, that can be associated to uh, a particular style that has been identified in the area of Mimogram, uh, where we have uh, slender figures, uh, very delicate rendering of the features, uh, with elongated eyes, um, short nose, and a smiling mouth with um, fuller lower lip. So these are already uh, good results uh, for a first observation. Continuing with these new insights on the style, uh, if we look at Buddha and devotees from Andandari, there are strong affinities uh, with the drawing style that has been identified in the Jambil Saidu zone, for example, Bukhara 1. Um, while the relief with the birth cycle from Chatpat are uh, similar, show resemblances uh, with um, models found in the Peshawar Mardin Basin. Another uh, peculiarity is uh, seen in this panel from uh, Andandere, the last one here. Uh, this shows a kind of a synthesis of uh, a schematic art from the Svad Valley that has been seen in the Svad Valley and a uh, feature from the school of Peshawar. Uh, this is just a first uh, insight on the stylistic observation that I've been possible thanks to a uh, first uh, batch of um, uh, digitization. Uh, but these, as I uh, mentioned, um, Passant, especially looking at this particular style here and the more local uh, aspects of uh, the production from um, uh, from Chakpat and from the Chakdara area, uh, lead us to a discussion about the issues and biases that this kind of uh, digitization project can uh, bring to light and give answers. And the most obvious one is uh, challenging the Eurocentric bias. So looking at how these different styles uh, were uh, not minoritarian at all, so there was not an actual um, predominance of um, uh, Greco-Roman elements over uh, local schools, oh, well, different styles. I would not even make a distinction between local and not local because it's all local. It's all local there. Uh, using only one set of lenses, those of the classical art, um, it was applied a strong Eurocentric bias on Gandharan studies. And this also led to make Gandhara the perfect excuse for uh, cultural cancellation and colonialism uh, at the time of the British Raj. Uh, because this parajment of contemporary culture uh, was one of the strongholds of British colonialism. Uh, so opposing Buddhism uh, with the um, contemporary um, religious expression of the subcontinent was a way to uh, make uh, the colonial discourse active in the area. Uh, so one of the possibility offered by this kind of uh, documentation uh, is the attempt to uh, separate our mind from the colonial matrix of power, so uh, engage further into the coloniality uh, and into the colonization of Gandharan art, uh, aiming at the impossible absence of bias, but uh, we can do better. I, I'm completely sure of that. Um, 
and uh, this also leads to an important issue that are reparation measures. Um, when we talk about the coloniality, um, the discourse is often focused on restitution and repatriation of objects that are often smuggled, especially uh, when uh, coming from places uh, that have been also subject to harsh historical uh, situations. Uh, so we're talking about looted and trafficked object, uh, but the repatriation, the actual repatriation of the object is not always requested by the government because it also uh, implied the necessity of um, um, a lot of work and a lot of investment and having the right uh, infrastructure to uh, repatriate and uh, maintain that what is repatriated. Uh, but repatriation and restitution also involves knowledge. And uh, one strategy is involving uh, local scholars and communities uh, to uh, the study of the object. But uh, one important point that digitization can do is facilitating the repatriation of knowledge. So it's uh, also, uh, they could also lead to um, uh, one step forward into decolonizing uh, Gandharan studies. Uh, I mentioned that the DIGA project also includes the preparation of a gazetteer. Uh, with the science, uh, but uh, we are all aware that making uh, open access uh, um, coordinates of sites that are uh, sometimes often not completely excavated or only surveyed, it's an invitation for looters to go there if we put the precise location out there on the internet. Uh, so there are risks with uh, open access um, that leads to facilitating trafficking, facilitating vandalism also and act of iconoclasm, for example. So uh, we need to also have strategies for risk management. Uh, one example, and these are just the last few slides with what we are actually discussing in this last month, uh, it's, for example, the German Gaz archaeological gazetteer uh, makes the exact coordinates only available to registered users, um, while um, it's only indicated a general position of sites that uh, to people that are not registered and not recognized as professionals that would not go just go there and lose everything. Uh, so this is one of the strategies that we are uh, discussing and trying to implement for the gazetteer of uh, Gandhara uh, and trying to prevent uh, issues and so as a mechanism of protection. Uh, one last uh, thing, uh, it's um, about the use of data and uh, the ownership of data. Uh, there's a huge debate in the data community, in, especially in digital humanities, about uh, the ethics which we need to handle this data. Uh, because data harvesting needs to be uh, fair uh, and uh, also the management is sharing. Because it's so easy to say open access, but we have to ask ourselves, are open, uh, open data really open to everybody? Not everybody has access to what we consider open. So, um, that's why these are things that need to be discussed. Uh, one, um, in the Gandhara community, these issues are um, not rarely uh, faced and rarely uh, discussed. Um, but in the data community, there's this protocol that is called the FAIR protocol, this one, about open data. They should be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Uh, but still, scholars identify some bias in this because they're still um, difficult to access for some communities. Uh, so, a new protocol that has been discussed, but this is not 
uh, specific to archaeology or art history, but is specific to indigenous studies, uh, is the CARE protocol. Um, and this kind of protocol gives good inputs also for us, even if the problem for Gandharan studies is about uh, the actual data ownership. Because uh, the, care pro the, the care protocol has been elaborated for uh, manufacturers and artifacts uh, coming from indigenous communities, especially in North America. Um, so actually, there are communities, living communities, that um, have ownership on the, the material. So what we need to ask ourselves is, who, we, who are the owners of a Gandharan art? Is Pakistan or also the monks, the Sri Lanka monks that went to visit, they go to visit, Javanese devotees, they go there. So there are several uh, um, topics that need to be uh, we need to pay attention to and I hope to do that in the next <laughs> steps of the project. I just wanted to um, put to your attention also this kind of uh, debate we have uh, in course. So uh, among the issues we need to discuss data ownership and open access to be uh, completely fair and uh, toward the different actors involved in Gandharan studies. And with this, I uh, conclude my uh, presentation and I thank you for your attention. Uh, in our uh, trading, you can find um, our website, our blog that will be soon updated with a blog entry about the fieldwork. So yes, we're just in the phase of revision of it and uh, our social media, I invite you all to follow us and interact and follow our <laughs> uh, work. Thank you very much. I wonder, since uh, fragments of Gandharan reliefs are distributed in museums and collections around the world, is there any, is there any talk about trying to assemble a database so that pieces from, you know, one stupid can be put together. Y yeah. Uh, of course, it's uh, a long-term perspective. Um, we are just uh, starting with the with this project, but uh, if the community uh, welcome uh, this project and the outputs of this project, uh, it the results will be open and uh, in an ideal world, all the collection can be interlinked in this way. Uh, this kind of topic has already been discussed, for example, with Dr. Laura Giuliano for the collection in Rome. That is a, another collection from archaeological excavation, so it will be very precious to have um, and to set in communication with the other collections. Um, besides the collection that are in uh, museums around the world, uh, it would be very important to make accessible the collection that are in the museums in Pakistan, uh, because most most of them, all of them, are from uh, are provenance and uh, of course uh, hide a lot of uh, information that we miss. Also, because most of the pieces that exit uh, the subcontinent uh, were accurately selected, also from Alexander Cunningham, for example, uh, to be the most Greek-looking. So that's also why we have this um, Greek-looking approach to Gandharan studies. But what was left behind and is in the storage of the museums of the old excavations, it's all the other part, the, 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 the other chapters of the Gandharan stories that is still hidden to most of us because did not make it to the great collection that have been uh, val valorized in our museums on this part of the world. So yeah, hopefully uh, setting things together can also uh, lead to identify uh, same components of the of the uh, same side, hopefully. Okay, thank you very much. much. Oh, sorry. All right, our next speaker.
uh, is Laura Giuliano. Uh, she's curator of the Indian and Southeast Asian Department at the Museum of Civilization, also Museum of Oriental Art, Giuseppe Tucci of Rome since 2000. She has been teaching Indian and South Asian art and archaeology at the faculties of Oriental Studies and Humanities of Sapienza University of Rome and has been a visiting professor at various foreign university institutes. Since 1997, she has been a member of the Italian Archaeological Mission in the UNESCO World Heritage Site of Watpu, Laos, um, and was the archaeologist of the mission for the Indo-Italian Conservation Project of the mural paintings in the Ajanta Caves, promoted by the Italian Ministry of Culture and the Archaeological Survey of India. Since 2014, she is the director of the archaeological mission Brahmanical Caves of Western India. She's the author of numerous publications and the editor of books on specific aspects of Indian art. She has been curator and co-curator of many exhibitions and their catalogs. She has been carrying out several research projects, both individually and as part of a team in Italy and abroad. And she's the author of numerous publications. Um, so today she will uh, speak to us on the archery competition of Siddhartha and the pre-marital ceremony in Gandharan art, an example of shared traditions in Buddhism and Indian epics. Please help me welcome Laura Juliana. So thank you very much, Sanjeev, for your presentation. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, first of all, let me thank Osmund, uh, Osmund Operace Sanjot Mehendale for inviting me to attend this conference. And Frank Bill, uh, uh, I think he's not here, no? Okay, <laughs> uh, helping us uh, in all the logistical aspects, even I had so many questions for him. Uh, it is a privilege to, for me to be here and to hear from you all about your research and to learn about what, what has been done and uh, about the new projects going on. I work in the National Museum of Oriental Art, now Museum of Civilization, where more than 2,000 sculptures of Gandharan art are conserved, some of them coming from the excavation conducted by the Italians in the Svat region, and particularly in the uh, Buddhist sites of Butkara, Pandar, and Saidu Sharif. In the museum, different kind of research on this collection are going on, but diagnostic investigations on the nature of the schists, the stucos, the colors and gilding that are sometimes still visible, and also iconographic and iconological studies, especially in comparison with the reliefs kept in other museums from other excavation and with the literary sources. At this stage, a project on the hikos of non-Buddhist religious tradition identifiable in the heart of Gandhara is in progress. On one hand, the exploration of local cults and divinities that would emerge in Brahmanical pantheon at that year become acolytes of the Buddha. And on the other, the presence of rituals and customs that give us a more precise idea of the cosmopolitan society in which the Gandharan heart was produced. What I'm presenting here related with the, uh, the scene of the archery competition of Siddhartha and Gandharan art is just an example of the type of investigation being carried out in the museum. So among the Gandharan reliefs, we find scenes of athletic competitions, mainly depictions of wrestling and archery, the subject of the present paper, as well as, less often, cutting through bundles of bamboo with a sword, riding, tug of war, slingshot, etc. For example, what is it? Okay. Uh, this one, or the archery competition, cutting uh, the bamboo and uh, uh, running, pro probably running, and uh, uh, tug of war. Most often, 
the scene depicted in the release find equivalence in the narratives in the sources. In fact, some tests, in particular the Samgabedavastu the Vinay of the Mulasar Vastivadin, the Lalita Vistora, the Mahavastu, and the Chinese translation of the Habinish Kramana Sutra, but also other Chinese sources, dwell on the episode of the contest organized to win the hand of Gopa or Yashodara, during which the young Siddhartha gives proof of his superior innate abilities in athletic competitions and many other arts. The list of trials in physical capacity and skills which Siddhartha underwent together with the other participants differs from one source to another as we can uh, as can be seen in the in this table according to the accounts in the Lalita Vistara and the Abhinish Kramana Sutra alongside this contest literary and mathematic competition were also held as well as testing knowledge of ritual of the philosophical systems, music and singing, etc. In this respect, we find a parallel in the classical world during the Pythian Games when contests in music and poetry were found alongside the athletic competitions. Here, I will be making a detailed examination of the accounts of the archery competitions in Buddhist geographic text one of the few competitions the sources dwell upon with detailed description and considering scenes of the episode in the Gandharan reliefs. First, however, let me briefly outline the environment in which the contest entered into by Siddhartha took place. Looking into the tradition, the episode is associated with and the role the archery competition had in the course of the event. Often, demonstration of the participant heroic virtues took place on the occasion of the Svayambara, or self-choice ceremony, a premarital custom during which a young girl of noble lineage could choose her groom from a crowd of suitors. The particular kind of Svayambara characterized by public competition in which the suitors were to prove their skill and capability in the heart of world to obtain the hand of the princess is known as Viryashulka Svayambara. So it means the self-choice with mainly deed as bride price. This custom was confined mostly to the royal family and is well known to us through the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, of course. This is a custom of very ancient origin. In fact, a number of scholars have conjectured that certain features of this premarital rite are to be traced back to an Indo-European matrix. For example, comparing literary examples of the Biryashulka Svoryambara with Greek sources, such as the episode of the contest organized to choose Penelope's second husband in the Odyssey, uh, Stephanie Jamison finds interesting links between the two traditions. Actually, the Briashul Kasvayambara severely limited, if not completely eliminated, the choice of the young woman who had to respect the outcome of the tournament. Her hand would be granted to the one who had given proof of his virile qualities and warrior virtues before the people. It is quite different from another type of Svayambara described in the sources, namely the Icha Svayambara, possibly the original form of the rite that saw the young girl enjoying practi practically total self-choice, for she could choose any, any of a number of men invited by her father for the purpose as her husband. An example of this type of self-choice is the Damayanti Svayambara narrated in the Mahabharata, in the, in the Nalokopakyana in the Mahabharata. But I may cite in this connection also some Buddhist sources as the story of Suprabha and Kashika Sundari in the head section of Avadana Shataka and also various Jatakas such as the Kunala Jataka that unfortunately there is no time here to examine it. In the 
reality, even with the Svayambara, which involved organization of a tournament, some form of freedom was probably still left to the girl. The bride could express her wishes or exclude from the contest those she disliked, as Drupadi did in the celebrated episode in the Mahabharata in the Adiparvam, in the case of Karna, the son of a charioteer, whom she deemed unworthy of her. The legend of the Buddha shows many points in common with this tradition, which is known to us mainly through the epic sources. It is, in fact, in the circumstances of the Svayambara requiring a heroic feat that we should understand the accounts of the contest engaged in by Siddhartha in the sources and the scenes of competitions, including the archery contest depicted in the Gandharan reliefs. That the tournament coincides with the Virya Shulka Svayambara emerges quite clearly from the passages of the Larita Vistara and the Abhinish Kramana, where it is clearly stated that Gopa or Yashodara was to be granted to the winner as a prize or as a trophy, as in the self choice of the happy tradition. For example, in the Lalita Vistara, it is said the daughter of Dandapani Shakya, the Shakya girl named Gopa, was put forward and at, at a tro as a trophy for the victor, and the pledge was sworn. Whoever here is victorious in swordsmanship, archery, combat, and wrestling shall have her. As said before, of all the trials organized for this contest, the archery competition is one of the few the geographic texts dwell upon with detailed descriptions. And indeed, together with the wrestling march, it is the most often depicted in Gandharan reliefs, showing the favor this discipline met in the Indian world as various other texts and the importance of Danur Veda attest. Danur Veda is proper, properly the knowledge of the bow, uh, where the bow becomes a sort of symbol for the entire military, si military science. Moreover, uh, this uh, the, the archery competition is recurrent, is recurrent in the epic tradition, being the test that most often has to be passed to in the hand of a young woman, as is the case of the Svayambara of Sita in the Ramayana and of Drupadi, Drupadi in the Mahabharata. Supremacy in this contest, possibly more than in other cases, reflects the royal and warlike values of the winner. In the case of the Buddha legend, the archery competition is the crucial test faced by Siddhartha to be able to add Gopa or Yashoda. The version of the archery competition recounted in, in the Sangha Beda Vastu, the Vinaya of the Mula Sarvastivadi, and the Lalita Vistra Mahavastu, and in the Abhinish Kramana Sutra, diverge in various details in that they are more or less concise, in some cases in the sequence of events, or fragmentation of them, but essentially they correspond. The account can be summarized in this way. Before the contest, the participant prepare the field, setting up the targets. Generally, these targets are the iron, iron drums, seven palm trees, one or more iron images of a boar, <clears throat> a sometimes seven field vessel. Once the field has been prepared, the archers begin to shoot their arrows, but none succeed in penetrating and shooting through all the targets. In a version narrated in the Lalita Vishtara and the Abhinish Kramana Sutra, when the Bodhisattva's turn comes to shoot, any bow he tries to draw breaks under his extraordinary vigor. He then asks his father, Shudodana, if there is any bow in the city strong enough to stand up to his strength. The king answers that conserved and honored in a temple of Kapilavastu is a bow that belonged to his grandfather, Simhananu, a bow that no man had seen succeed, succeed in stringing and drawing. When the bow is brought into the arena, the other suitors try to draw it, but in vain. 
Siddhartha, however, succeeded in stringing and drawing it with perfect nonchalance. In some accounts, it is uh, he is said to have performed this operation remaining seated, uh, cross-legged. <laughs> then, before the cheering crowd, he takes the arrow then, that then shoots through all the, st uh, the targets, so iron drums, seven palm trees, and then the image or image of an iron bore before planking into the ground, well, as recounted in the Abhinesh Kramana Sutra and the Sangha Beda Vastu of the Vinaya Dumula Sarvastivadi in the spring wells up. The Vinaya adds that a Naga brings back the arrow to the Bodhisattva. In the case of the Gandharan reliefs, the scene is depicted with three different figurative schemes that I am going to describe. The first type of representation is attested in a relief possibly a unicum, that came from a private Swiss collection catalogued in the 70 by Maurizio Taddei in the uh, um, external archive of the Museo Nazionale d'Arte Orientale, National Museum of Oriental Art, then auctioned by Bonhams. Below a continuous frieze displaying the home arcade motif are two scenes separated by a semicolon. The scene on the right shows the walls and gate of Kapilavastu, while on the left we see three figures. In the center, Siddhartha viewed standing frontally, holding his grandfather, Simhananu Bov, to his right a figure with a kiver, and to his left a figure in princely clothes, possibly the judge of the competition. To the far left, we can see the fronts of a palm tree, the scene may represent the moment when Siddhartha picks up his father's grandfather bow and is about to draw it and to shoot, his, shoot, to shoot his arrow, or possibly the moment when his victory is proclaimed. So here you see the uh, wall of Kapilavastu. Here is Siddhartha, and uh, here is the figure with the cure, and that maybe. Mm, we don't know, it's a, it's a figure that possibly could be the judge. And here you see the palm tree that record also in, in many, other, uh, many other reliefs. The second type of composition we come is this. In the center of the scene, a horseman at the, at the gallop is seen in profile to the left, drawing the bow, presumably Siddhartha Honis did Kantaka flanked by other figures observing the scene. In the case of the relief conserved in the Victorian Albert Museum, uh, in front of the horseman wearing Central Asian dress and a turban, we see a palm tree with the target hanging on it, characterized by a decoration device in the center, possibly a floral decoration. In this case, the scene to the immediate, immediate right shows the killing of the elephant by the Badak. So here you see, uh, again you have the uh, Tala tree with the target, and here you see the killing of the Vedanta. Or here you, we have uh, um, a detail of the same uh, relief. Finally, the scheme depicting the archery competition most frequently encountered shows one or two standing archers turned towards the left, seen from behind, while they draw their bows, aiming at the target hung on a palm tree or raised on a pole. The reliefs belonging to this type of composition show numerous variants in the case of figures surrounding the principal personage. They may simply be people observing the competition, as in the case of this relief from a private collection, where the group of onlookers consists of four main figures, two standing and two seated, the latter two possibly being Shudodana and Dandapani. In uh, some other example, on the other hand, the figures surrounding the archers seem to be taking an active part in the competition as assistants, such is the case of a figure to the right of the Bodhisattva shown holding his elbow with both hands as if helping to pull back the bowstring in a relief in the British Museum. And in this one in the Hirayama Eco Silk Road Museum. In 
yet another example in the British Museum, the main figure to the right of the Bodhisattva is holding an arrow. Particularly interesting in this relief is the figure depicted to the left between the target and the Bodhisattva himself. It is a tail monkey holding the quiver or, as suggested by Zwalf, a support for the bow. So here you see the figure uh, with, the, with the arrow, and here you see the monkey. A kneeling monkey facing to the left and holding a rod with the target raised on the top of it is also depicted in a relief from Saidu Sharif in the Zvat Valley, excavated by the Italian archaeological mission in Zvat and now conserved in the National Museum of Oriental Art. Zwalf observed that a similar figure with a curved tail is possibly represented on a relief from Malakan preserved in Peshawar. Again, a monkey supporting a target seemed to be represented on a relief from the Government Museum of Chennai, actually in the drawing of by Monica Zin published in Schlinglof, 2011, uh, it has been interpreted as a monkey. In other cases, the identification of the monkey is more doubtful, but possible. It is on this figure and on its presence in Siddhartha's archer's, archer's competition that will be shortly focusing, focusing our attention later. In some specimens, however, the figure in the line of fire is a young boy holding the cure with protruding arrows, a cylindrical object or a road with the target raised on the top of it. See, for example, the relief in the British Museum, the one from Nimogram, now in the Zwat Museum, and the one in a private collection published by Kurita, and another one in the Hirayama, the, the other one in the Hirayama Silk Road Museum, where two boys are represented. So sometimes we have a a monkey, sometimes we have small boys. Attention will be given now to the comparison between the textual and the figurative traditions to consider if and how they are interrelated, or if, at least in some cases, we should hypothesize the influence of other sources. Among the figurative details corresponding closely with the textual description, in numerous reliefs, we find the palm tree with a target hanging on it. This image encapsulates the image of the seven palm trees, while the target may be identified as the iron drum mentioned in all the text. Because the text doesn't speak, uh, they don't speak uh, uh, about only one uh, um, one tala tree. They every time they say seven uh, tala trees, seven palm trees. And uh, uh, what is in interesting that uh, in the Gandharan art uh, we have uh, only one tala tree. So this one tala tree encapsulated the seven tala trees. But uh, for example, in uh, Ajanta Cave 16, we have all the trees, and even in Borobudur. See. This is the archery competition in the cave 16, and here you see all the trees, and the same in Borobudur. It's not really clear, but maybe you can, uh, you can understand. At least in some cases, the progression of the, progression of the scene of the on the panel seems to correspond to the sequence of the episode in the Abhinish Kramana Sutra, where the cutting of the reeds and the killing of the elephant by the Vatatta follow the heart of the competition. Such is the case of the relief conserved in the National Museum of Oriental Art and that one in the private collection in the Kurita archive, where you have the cutting of the reeds here, just following, and here the killing uh, of the elephant by the Vatatta. It should be noted that on the Gandharan reliefs, the episode recounted in the Sangha Bevadavastu of the Vinaya of the Mula Sarvastivadi of the spring of water welling up when the Bodhisattva's arrow plung plunges into the ground is not depicted. 
Instead, it occurs in Ajanta Cave 16, we have seen before, where a Naga is represented bringing the herald back to Siddhartha, and also in Kizil Stair Cave, Stairs Cave, where beside the Naga also the well is no. Actually, of Kizil, I didn't have a good, uh, a good photographs, but here in, uh, in Ajanta, you can see that the Naga is uh, giving back the uh, herald to Siddhartha. Only in the relief of the British Museum that we, we, uh, we had seen before, this one, can the figure with an arrow to the left of the Bodhisattva possibly be interpreted in the light of, of the event narrated in the text, even if it does not exhibit the appearance of the Naga? This one. Other details like the variety of poses in which the standing archer is portrayed, the figures assisting the bodhisattva, holding the quiver for him or supporting his arms when the bow is most tensed, are undubitably the fruit of direct, attentive observation of actual practice and knowledge of competitions and contests of the sort. The parting from the narrative in the sources is the figure of the Bodhisattva riding a galloping horse, an image that cannot be derived from the text, so far known to us, since nowhere is Siddhartha said to have shot the hero on the horse back. On the contrary, at least in two cases uh, that told bef um, before, um, he is said to have drawn the bow remaining seated. And this representation is, is a probable reference to the Kushan costume, since it echoes the figure of the Central Asian horseman. On making detailed analysis of the archery competition scenes in Gandhara, we notice that in some cases they may show striking similarities with the written account of the event, possibly at least some of them show more affinities with the Abhinish Kramana and the Sangha Bedavastu Devinaya. Otherwise, they reveal features that depart from it, showing iconographic details that cannot be derived from the text, coloring the episode with elements derived from observation of reality. But there is another detail that seems to be derived from another version of the story since lost, filling out the overall sense of the image. What significance, in fact, is to be attributed to the monkey holding the quiver or holding up a road with the target depicted in some reliefs. The presence of this figure, which is not named in the sources, suggests a number of considerations that might lead us quite far. Images of monkeys depicted in scenes of the life of the Buddha or on architectural elements are to be seen in the Gandharan relief, but also in the subsequent period I might mention, for example, the monkey offering honey to the Buddha, representing the famous story narrated in the Dharmapada and in the Sangha Bedavastu. The meditating monkey is depicted on, among the rocks together with other wild animals on some stilts of the Hindra Shaila Gua. Or, for example, the meditating monkey in the National Museum of Oriental Art, interpreted by today as an apex of a coronated arch, and belonging to a later period, the two meditating monkeys found in chapters 23 and 37 of Tapasardar, where they probably formed part of the setting of two epiphanies, unfortunately beyond our scope here. But the case in question is quite different. We might think that these are trained animals, but we cannot ignore another possibility. According to Vladimir Zwalf, the association of a monkey with a bodhisattva during the archery contest echoes the legend of Rama, who, at least in the Valmiki transposition, after defeat with the bow, the marriage with Sita and exile in the forest, was helped by the army of monkeys to find his wife, who, who had been abducted by Ravana, suggesting the possibility of an interaction between the two stories. He gave this interpretation in uh, his famous catalog in the uh, British Museum Reliefs. Um, 
relating uh, on one of the British Museum reliefs we, we had seen, and he was also, um, because he was very much aware also of this relief in the National Museum and other reliefs with this monkey. So in a footnote, he gives this interpretation, gave this interpretation. Actually, this is hardly surprising since points of context between the two narratives also emerge in the Buddhist hagiographic literature we have seen, which in relation to Siddhartha's contest uses a series of topoi characteristics of the Ramayana and more generally of the Indian epic. In the circumstances of the Svayambara, the motive of the extremely heavy bow, which can only be drawn by the Bodhisattva, finds a parallel in the mage of Rama. Drawing the bow and breaking it with his figure, succeeding in a feat in which all the, prince, uh, all the pr princes uh, present at the Svayambara Sita had failed. Both the bow drawn by Siddhartha and the one raised by Rama had belonged to illustrious figures. The former had belonged to Siddhartha's grandfather, Simhananu, defined in the Mahavastu of the race of Deva. And before being born into the arena, had been conserved and honored in the temple, while the latter, the one um, take, taken by Rama, um, was Shiva's bow, handed over to the ancestor of Janaka, Sita adoptive father, and religiously conserved in his palace. Another motive recurring in the Buddhist account and the epic and in the happy tales is the hero worship of the weapon before preparing to perform his feat. In the Mahavastu, the Bodhisattva, before drawing the bow, honors it with a fragrant garland out of reverence for his grandfather. Similarly, Arjuna performs a gesture of reverence to the weapon before notching the hero. Thus, the proof of superhuman ability shown by Siddhartha, whose arrow shoots through all the targets penetrating the seven palm trees and the iron bore image to stick into the ground, is strongly reminiscent of the feat performed by Arjuna, who passed the test for the Svayambara of Draupadi, hitting for five successive times the high of a golden fish placed on the top of a high pole through her rotating wheel by observing its reflection in the oil contained in a basin. But this same image of the Buddhist text, furthermore, finds a parallel in the episode of the Ramayana recounted in the Kishkin Takanda and represented in a relief of the Kailasanatha temple of Ellora, during which to demonstrate to Sugriva his skills as a warrior, Rama releases an arrow which shoots through seven palm trees and pierces the ground, after which it reappears in his quiver. Here you can see, okay, so, sorry. Uh, here you can see, so, so it's, it's a topos, these of the seven palm trees that you find uh, in the Buddha stories and also in the Ramayana, but uh, in the Ramayana you find especially in this episode of the Kishkin Takanda, so not in the Svayambara, but in this episode uh, of when uh, Rama needs to show to Sugriva his uh, superior. Uh, <clears throat> While uh, um, various points of contact emerge between the account of Siddhartha and the Indian epic tales, suggesting a very early origin of, for this narrative model, as indeed striking analogy to certain passages in the Greek epic tradition appear to be out, most notably, as we have said, the contest organized to choose Penelope's second husband. It is in the literature of the Jataka that the parallels between uh, with the Ramakata stand out uh, in a particularly telling way. As we know, some of the Jatakas represent Buddhist version of certain tales also included in the Ramayana by Valmiki. Among the many, I may recall in particular the Shyama Jataka, similar to the story of Dasharatha killing the son of the Muni in the Yodakanda. Uh, the story of Rama was also known to the author of the Vesantara Jataka in Agatha he incidentally named Sita, famous for her devotion to her husband, and in the description of the Prince Vesantara departures into exile, 
It recalled Rama's departure from Ayodhya as recounted in Ayodhya Kanda. Buddhist literature also elaborated its own version of the Ramakataka in the well-known and studied Dasharata Jataka, a tale in the collection of the Jataka Pali generally considered one of the earliest written accounts of the legend, although not all agree on this point, for example, Lombridge. Here, the Bodhisattva explicitly says, in the previous birth, Shuddhadana was Dasharata, Mahamaya was the mother of Rama, Sita was Raula's mother, Bharata was Ananda, Lakshmana was Hariputta. The people, the people devoted to Rama were those who have followed me in this life, and I was Rama. The story shows numerous variants departing from the classical version by Valmiki. The Sharata is the king of Varanasi and not of Ayodhya. Sita is both a sister and wife of Rama, a detail that has given rise to numerous interpretation, but which seem to confirm that the story told in the Jataka derives from an archaic core of the Rama legend. The substantial difference from the Brahmanic version, the Balmiki version, moreover, lies in the fact that the story revolves around the episode of Rama exiles, exile and is returned to the throne after 12 years while no account is given to the abduction of Sita by Ravana or the great war fought against the demon, nor indeed of the help received from the army of monkeys. However, according to some scholars, these events are recounted in the Anamaka Rajajataka, the former birth of an unnamed king, king, a text which unfortunately has not survived in the original version, occurring in the 46 tale in the Sat Paramita Samgraha Sutta, translating into Chinese in 251 of the Common Era. The Chinese version of the story contains many episodes corresponding to those of the Ramayana, without mentioning the names of the characters, and can be considered an abridged version of the prime of Valmiki. This text constitutes evidence that in the second, third century of the common era, the Buddhist authors were acquainted with the part of the Rama legend not recounted in the Dasharata Jataka, which included the protagonist's friendship with the population of monkey. Thus, we may now take it that one or a number of Ramakata cores and of the tales that were eventually included in the poem of Almiki found a place and interpretation in the Buddhist literature at least until the early centuries of the common era, attested by the fact that this story is of common occurrence in Indian culture, a legend that is not only Brahmanic, Brahmanical, but as argued by Reynolds, is better understood as an Indian Southeast Asian story that has been crystallized in the context of a variety of traditions, including but not limited to Hinduism. It was drawn upon by various religious tradition, traditions, including the Jain, interpreting the single tales in the light of their own values and codes of conduct. This remains, I believe, much to investigate in this field. Here, the Gandharan representation of the archery competition where a monkey appear in the head of Siddhartha could add a further piece in the long tradition of contaminations considered above. I may wonder if for this particular representation, the Gandharan artist took inspiration from a version of the contest passed down orally or recorded in a text since lost which in turn had drawn some contents, some contents from the local original core of the Rama legend. Nevertheless, the possibility remained that, aware of the similarities between the tale of Siddhartha's feet with the bow and that of Rama, the artist added the monkey simply as a sign of this association. Furthermore, if these conjectures uh, should find a confirmation, uh, these representations could be considered most amongst the first figurative, albeit indirect, references to the Ramakata, 
the earliest iconographic evidence relating to which can be safely dated back to the Gupta, Gupta period, unless we do not want to take into consideration the coin of Uvishka, where is depicted the figure interpreted as Rama. Thank you. I think it's an idea. I'm not really certain about. Uh, um, it's just. Uh, I think there are so many contaminations in Gandharan art. Uh, as Serena was uh, speaking about, uh, um, sometimes uh, we need to read uh, even in the you know, um, just. Uh, very small details, they can say to us many things about, about this cosmopolitan society. Um, there are so many mysteries, I think, uh, and uh, um, contamination between, between this world, the Buddhist world, and also the local cults and the ballads and all these things. I think it's still it's very present, and sometimes we, we can try to find out. So. I, I was, I, I don't think you said anything about the form of the bow. And I noticed, for instance, in the last image uh, with the, uh, the hot coin of Vishka, ah. it's a, a simple yeah. bow. Yeah, you're right. But in uh, some of the Gandharan images, like the one from Hirayama, it looks like a compound bow. And what I was reminded of is uh, we're in the Mari Emino room, and Mari Emino wrote a really interesting article. <laughs> I think it's called compound bow in Indian art and literature, but I don't, I don't remember. I don't think you talked about Gandharan art. So I think that would be thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for this. Uh, as long as I was in the 1930s or something. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, Paul and then Sally, and then uh, we have to move on to. This, this, this may be a uh, detail, but I'm just wondering about the number seven. Because in the narrative sections of Mahayana Sutras, when people rise into the air, they always rise for the height of seven Tala trees. Not eight, not six, but always seven. So there's, and I've been puzzled by that number. And I think now I'm hearing your presentation, that this association between Tala trees and the number seven may reflect uh, the, the narrative traditions that you've been describing. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I cannot hear you very well. It's not a taller tree than Valmiki. It's a taller tree. Shala. But it's a type of teak tree. Okay. But you, you, you see in the, in the Kishkin Takanda, you, but uh, some, sometimes uh, it is said Shala tree, and in other, uh, in other cases it's said the Tala tree. Okay, because I understood that Shala was a misunderstanding and instead not, it is not. Okay. Okay. Yes, <laughs> there were so ram so many Ramakata actually, no? Uh, okay. 
Because when Miki conflated two, actually he conflated uh, possibly two traditions. The one of the, um, uh, of the banishment of uh, Rama, no? And uh, the other one, uh, no? Okay. 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 I, I, I want to know. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for telling me. Okay. Can I ask you? Yeah? closely related is the Arjuna uh, shooting up the, the eye of the fish to these earlier uh, competitions, shooting through the seven trees and so on. Connections? No. N between Arjuna, I mean, and, uh, and Siddhartha. Um, I mean, the connection is is just that it is it is a feat. It's a feat during the Svayambara, uh, but uh, it is a, uh, the realization of this feat is different uh, in this in the two stories. Uh, but uh, it, it 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 happens uh, both in the Svayambara, in the Svayambara of Yashodara, and the Svayambara of Dropadi, actually. So. It, And also it is very interesting, for example, in the Buddhist tradition, the tradition in the um, Avadana Shataka of the Svayambara, that it's very interesting because uh, generally the Svayambara, it, it's, uh, uh, it's uh, considered a custom uh, uh, of the Kshatriya, uh, Kshatriya girl. No? Kshatriya, only Kshatriya girl, especially in the Hapik, can have a Svayambara. But in the Buddhist tradition, also girls of the Vaishya families, of a um, um, very rich family, can uh, have a Svayambara. But the interesting thing is that in Avadana Shataka, they choose the Svayambara to choose a different way of life. Uh, it means that uh, they have, uh, all, it, because uh, it, this is a Nietzsche Svayambara, not a Birya Shulka Svayambara, that one described in the, uh, in the Avarana Shataka. And uh, so they have the people gathered, uh, the suitors gathered uh, for their Svayambara. So they have to choose, but they don't choose any of the suitors because they want to choose the Buddha. So they appear on, 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 uh, mm, with the banner, with the image of the Buddha, and they use the Svambiyambara as a stratagem to say that they want another way of life. But that is very interesting also, this uh, I mean, freedom of the girl, in a way. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is John Guy, curator of South and Southeast Asian art at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. His research interests include the temple arts of the Hindu, Buddhist, Jain traditions and ceramic and textile trade of the Indian Ocean diaspora. He has been at the helm of major exhibitions, including Interwoven Globe in 2013 and Lost Kingdoms, Hindu Buddhist sculpture of early Southeast Asia in 2014. He joined the Met's Asian, uh, Asian department in 2008 after 22 years at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, where he was senior curator of Indian art with responsibility for the sculpture collections. He has acted as an advisor to UNESCO on historical sites in Southeast Asia and worked in partnership with government archeological agencies in Thailand, Laos, and Vietnam, including at the sites of Wat Pu in Laos and Mai Son in Vietnam assisting in documenting for World Heritage Listing. Other projects have included maritime excavations, most recently the Hoi An shipwreck cargo in Vietnam, the Belatan shipwreck in Indonesia, and the Panom Surin shipwreck cargo in Thailand. He is an elected fellow of the London Society of Antiquaries since 2003. Now, today, uh, John is joining us uh, to share some exciting news regarding an object finally on view at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. Welcome, John. Good afternoon. I, I, my name is John Guy. I'm the creator of South Asian Art at the Metropolitan Museum of Art New York. And, and, and 
delighted to be part of uh, this uh, Gantaran workshop uh, symposium at the University of Berkeley, uh, the Center for Silk Road Studies. Um, I've really just got an announcement to make, a short uh, breaking news announcement. Um, all of you in the field, all of us know, of course, of the Brussels Buddha of the year five um, inscribed and dated uh, Buddha, which has been sitting in a private Japanese uh, religious foundation collection for uh, three or four decades now, uh, not really accessible to the wider community, although, of course, the inscription has been shared and studied by uh, all the leading uh, scholars of uh, Gantari and uh, um, Karoshti uh, from uh, uh, around the world. So uh, I wanted to uh, bring to your attention the, the piece just to sh show uh, uh, briefly some of the uh, uh, qualities of the object um, and to um, uh, bring it to your attention now that it's um, finally uh, appearing uh, on public display uh, at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York um, on long-term loan from a private collector. Uh, so this this is a, a significant moment uh, for us uh, as a community to have access to this object, to examine it more closely and so on. So with all, all of you all be aware, the Gantara Year 5 Triad Buddha is uh, one of the more spectacular and uh, objects to have been recovered in the second, later 20th century and to enter the mainstream uh, corpus of, of, of the highly important uh, Gantaran art. Uh, here it is in all its splendor, uh, it's an extraordinarily beautiful relief um, and uh, by virtue of its uh, in, inscription, which is, uh, it places it as the fifth dated in, uh, sculpture uh, belonging to the wider Ganharan corpus, so uh, an enormous uh, important addition to, to the field of study. Um, these, these dated sculptures, uh, uh, of course, all, uh, help to provide a, a framework, a chronological framework um, uh, for, for Gantaran art, uh, but uh, as everyone here is aware, the uh, absolute uh, starting dates for the Kanichka era uh, have been contentious for a very long period of time, um, subject to endless scholarly debate. I think finally now it would seem to be uh, resolved uh, following Harry, Harry Falk's um, reading of, of, of the, the year one. Um, and um, from that, um, although un, ultimately unproven, this provides a, a, a reliable starting point for the placing of sculptures in this chronology. And within in that context, our steely here, um, with its Gantari language and, and Karoshti script, uh, provides us with a year, a year five of an unspecified rulership, um, uh, sign so signaling really the, the, this ongoing uh, complexity of, of assigning absolute dates uh, to these uh, regnal years, with which would. Uh, when often the question is what uh, what reign uh, does the inscription refer? So uh, in this case, um, the iconographic conventions we're seeing in this sculpture, along with the style of execution, uh, place this, I think, fairly securely in a mature phase of Gantaran Buddhist art. Uh, I would argue for the reign of Kanishka II, uh, the second quarter of the third century common era, um, and uh, if that indeed is the case, uh, year five would position this sculpture on or about 229 Common Era. Um, and that would seem to be a reasonable date stylistically uh, as well. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a sculpture of, of, of intense beauty um, in, and in very, very fine condition with minor, minor surface losses and wear. Uh, I show you the Dhammadrakra Mudra uh, gesture beautifully executed. Um, we have parallels, of course, in other uh, major major sculptures known to all of you. The Muhammad Nari um, uh, Buddha in Paradise scene on the screen is one of perhaps the ultimate statement in this in this of this genre, with its elaboration of the celestial spheres and celebration of the uh, of the Buddha. Uh, of course, the uh, closest. Uh, Sculptural relief is the Sari Bahal uh, Triad, uh, now in Peshawar Museum, uh, which dated on the following the uh, 127 dating, year one dating system, uh, would, would, uh, would date to around 132 common era, um, so in the second quarter of the second century uh, common era. It's, uh, this uh, provides 
close parallels iconographically um, and um, some indeed some parallels as well stylistically uh, here is the um, Saribahal um, piece uh, in situ during the excavations uh, a century ago um, another work which is on ex exhibit at the Berkeley Art Museum currently for the exhibition curated by um, Osman Babarachi uh, is this beautiful uh, work from a private collection of uh, Buddha in Dhammachakra Mudra uh, in a, in throned in a lotus, on a lotus pedestal in a shrine uh, accompanied by attendant figures including um, Panchika and Hariti in the lower register there. Uh, details of both of these you can compare quite closely and see how they'll relate. We're reminded of course of the importance of chroming and gilding in original Gandharan sculpture, which is almost invariably lost to us. It was detail of the Buddha himself um, seated in this position, uh, some wear and tear to the, the, the face, but in beautifully rendered uh, detailing, uh, but no sign of recarving, which is often the case uh, with historic material, particularly of the facial area. Uh, the two attendant uh, bodhisattvas uh, here on the the, uh, on the right, uh, seen by the viewer, is uh, Avalokiteshvara with the Amatama Buddha in the headdress. Um, and on the uh, left uh, is uh, an image almost certainly of uh, my trail, the hand carrying the flask is, as you can see, now missing. A parallel uh, in the Kachawa uh, Museum example. The canopy of flowering trees and leaves, um, which shadow cast a uh, umbrella-like um, um, protective shadow over the, the ensemble beneath, very beautifully, deeply cut uh, in open relief in some cases. And similarly, the, the, the low, deeply cut lotus uh, pedestal at the bottom. But of course, what most people pay attention to is the all-important inscription, um, which um, and uh, has see, uh, received uh, almost universal uh, acceptance as being both authentic um, and, and uh, Correct in all respects of grammar and 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 content and uh, letter form, epigraphic uh, style, um, and um, provides a, a very important uh, record for us of, of the dedication of this work. Uh, here it is in more detail. It's well published. I won't uh, linger on this. Um, and uh, synoptically, it says the pious gift, gift of the monastic, but Ananda I learned in the three baskets. Uh, Petakas uh, offered in on honor of God, probably the deceased parents uh, in the year five. Um, and I'm um, suggesting 329 of Kanishka II is uh, the likely date for this. So that's simply to bring that to your attention. Uh, it, it's not online because of it being a private loan to the museum, uh, where our collection otherwise is almost entirely online for you to access uh, anywhere in the world. Uh, but uh, it's on display in our galleries for an indefinite period of time uh, as a new centerpiece to the collection. And um, I hope it will stimulate um, a lot of interest uh, from the wider uh, community um, as we proceed uh, uh, with uh, our own studies uh, proceed to another level. Um, I should also just in conclusion mention that uh, we've invited uh, Professor Jung Ri from Seoul University in Korea uh, to present uh, a lecture dedicated on this very subject of the Year Five Buddha as the uh, 2022 annual South Asian lecture at the Met, which is this year being held on uh, Friday, March 18th. And uh, notice of this will go out, of course, as uh, all the usual uh, uh, outlets. So um, uh, that we look forward to, to his commentary on this work and situating it in the broader corpus of dated Gantaran works. So thank you for your attention and I look forward to welcome, welcoming you to the Metropolitan Museum. Thank you. Our next speaker is Olivier Bordeaux. He is an archaeologist and numismatist. Since 2020, a researcher at the National Center for Scientific Research, the CNRS in France. He completed his studies under the supervision of Professor Osman Bopiracci at the University Paris Sorbonne and defended his PhD in 2015. Since then, he has been the deputy director of the French archeological delegation in Afghanistan, DAFA, between 2017 and 2019, 
and is currently a member of the French Archaeological Mission in southern Tajikistan, headed by Mathilde Villain. His present research projects include the publication of the Kushan coin collection from the French National Library, the study of trade and transit routes between Central Asia and Western China during the Eurasia, Kushan, and Han periods, as well as several coin studies linked to the Hellenistic and Kushan period Central Asia. Welcome, Olivier Bordeaux. So before beginning, I would like to apologize for not being able to be present at this workshop physically, but nonetheless heartfully express all my thanks for, to Osmu Bukarachi, Sanyat Mendale, the Tank Center for Circle Studies and the University of California at Berkeley for their generous invitation to take part in this workshop. My presentation today will focus on the Yuichu and Kushan period which broadly expands from the middle of the second century BCE to the fourth century CE in a vast territory which extends from the present day former Soviet republics of Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, and Kyrgyzstan, as well as far Western China, down to Pakistan and Northern India through Afghanistan. This whole area will be referred to as Central Asia. As we shall see, we will shortly detail the Hellenistic presence in Central Asia in order to demonstrate how the Yuichu and then the Kushans build up on this heritage while also integrating neighboring ones, thus creating a unique cultural identity, which can be defined by their iconography, uh, material culture, monetary policies, and so on. In this regard, the coins are one of the most telling artifacts thus once more supporting the old upheld saying that Central Asia history is first and foremost a numismatic one. Without hurting, we hope, anyone's feelings, we shall shortly have a look at the eminent neighbours of Central Asia at the time frame which is of interest to us. During the time of the Kushans, the Parthians in the west, in Han China in the east and the various kingdoms rising and falling in the Indian northwestern subcontinent will have a profound influence on the Yubichu tribes and Kushan Empire. Being rightfully often described as the empire located in the heart of the Silk Roads crossing through Central Asia, the Kushan Empire will naturally play an active role in participating, protecting and developing the straight routes. Our detailed knowledge of such operations and their evolution in time is, however, insufferably incomplete to this day. Central Asia is a world of natural resources which are plentiful, as Strabo in his geography tells us that everything can grow in Bactria, say for the olive tree, but also of strong physical constraints and first and foremost mountain chains. In the heart of Afghanistan, the Hindu Kush rises up to more than 7,000 meters high, while only a few passes between Central Asia and China through the Pamirs are anywhere below 4,000 meters high. Nonetheless, as early as the Bronze Age, may we find strong cultural and material links between all these regions, which are represented here by the satrapies of the Achaemenid Empire. The geography and the climate of Central Asia thus makes water a central element of everyday life, nay an obsession during the Hellenistic period. Archaeology has given selected but detailed examples of the use of our artificial water channels for irrigation purposes, such as in the Bactria Oasis or the Aichanum agricultural plain. The wealth of Bactria and thus of the Yuichu and the Kushan Empire must have played a major, if not first-rate, role in the exceptionally fast expansion of the latter. During the Hellenistic period, several temples connected with the worship of the Oxus and or characterized by rituals connected with water have been unearthed, such as the invented niche temple in Aichamum and the Tartisangin sanctuary dedicated to the Oxus god. A short detour through the same Hellenistic period in the mid second century BCE takes us to the time of the King Eucratides I, whose reign extends from 171 to 145. This king, uncommon in many regards, 
managed to unite the Greek of Actrian and in the Greek kingdoms under his rule by getting rid of all his opponents. His wealth seems to have been extraordinarily magnificent as the unique 20 stator coin or medal struck to commemorate his victory over the Indo Greek kingdom is proof of. A die study of a single coin series struck by this king has led to the identification of 258 opus dies, that is a theoretical low estimate of about 4 million tetradrachs, while bearing in mind that this number does not include the rest of his coinage. In Eastern Bactria, his reign is characterized by a large brand new building program program at Ai Hanum, which in all likeliness was his capital. It is in the very same city that a number of discoveries bear testimony of the military campaigns in India of Eucratides I and the wealth he brought back from them. Among these, the Indian plague holds a special place, while some of the economical inscriptions from the treasury tell us about payment in Indian coins called kashrapanas that is, punch-mark coins. The Greek Bactrian crossed the Indukush during the early 2nd century BCE and rapidly established a second kingdom in the Big Ram, Kabul, Chosada, and Taxila valleys. The death of Eucratides in 145, by the hand of his own son, whose identity still remains a mystery, is the beginning of a profound political crisis in the Greek Bactrian kingdom. It is precisely at that time that two major migration movements do converge into Central Asia. On the one hand, Scythian populations coming from the northern steppe, which however do not settle down, but rather continue to the Indus Valley. And on the other hand, nomads originating from China, from where they had to flee under pressure from the Xiongnu, themselves facing Han China. These nomads are called Yuechu, in the Chinese written sources. Their migration can be decomposed into several steps, from their presence in central China at the end of the 3rd century BCE, to their escape through Khotan and northern Pakistan for some, and through Fergana and possibly as far west as the Iron Gates, and finally Bactria for the others. Among the Chinese written sources, we shall focus on the Hanshu, that is the Book of the Han, written around the first or the second century CE. This source tells us about the organization of the Uichu in Bactria, which is called Daxia, and narrates the fall of Hellenistic power in those terms. Originally, Daxia, that is Hellenistic Bactria, was without a supreme ruler, constantly strong cities gave themselves small lords, the people were weak and fear battled. So when the moving Uichu arrived, they subdued it completely. We are told of five tribes headed by a Yabgu, a term, a term which can be understood as a ruler, and various toponyms. Several of them have, have been closely studied by historians, sometimes leading to various interpretations as to their localization. The Chinese term Sihu is most likely an attempt at translating phonetically the word Yabgu. Likewise, it is widely accepted that the name Guishuang, or one of the Yabgu, undoubtedly stands for the name Kusha, given the closeness between the two terms. Unfortunately, we do not dispose of any other written source about the Yuichu than the Chinese, and our understanding of their settling down and political organization in Bactria must mainly rely on coins. In this regard, the Yuichu clearly demonstrates excellent capacity for adaptation as they adapt some of the monetary policies of the predecessors and start striking various series of imitations of Greek Bactrian coinages. This includes both silver and bronze coins. Several objective elements allow us to identify these coins as posthumous issues, the style and its progressive degradation, the typology and its evolution, the often corrupted Greek legend, the metal quality which worsens over time, and finally the monograms, since almost none of them actually belong to the ruler whose coins are imitated. This phenomenon is the response designed by the Uichu 
quite possibly in order to address the mere continuity of the economic life of Bactria, as well as the need for support of the trade routes crossing their territory. Both Koenigs north and south of the Indukush, that is both Greco-Bactrian and Indo ones, have undergone this particular phenomenon. The first information which is given by those imitation is, in most cases, after which king did Greek rule end up in a given territory. The second is closely related to their geographical distribution and is most useful to historians and numismatists in order to pinpoint the territory of the different Yucha tribe. The latter question remains an open question for now and in the lack of clear archaeological evidence. Indeed, the Uvitcher do not only take over coin production as their pottery production also shows strong similarities to the Hellenistic period, quite possibly in the very same production workshops accompanied by some new forms. The closeness in style as this sometimes became a real difficulty for ceramologists. Archaeology has confirmed that in several cities, such as Bactra, Turmes, Dorvas in Tepe, or Tartis and Gin, the cities were not abandoned, as Aichan was, but rather reoccupied by the immediate successors of the Greek or Bactrians. A closer look at northern Bactria provides a few interesting clues about the Uyghur. When compiling numismatic data from French and Russian literature regarding the discovery of said imitations, it becomes firstly clear that most of them are to be found in sites near major rivers, which is not surprising in itself given the logic of setting down and where archaeological expeditions have been focusing their work. What is much more fascinating is how the Heliopolis imitations are clearly focused on the Sherabad and Surkandaya valleys and the Eucratides imitations in the Kafirnigan and the Varsh valleys, somewhat less often for the latter, possibly because of fewer archaeological excavations. The distribution of these coins seems to reflect some kind of territorial organization if we accept the idea that at least two of the Uichi tribes only struck imitation of a given Greco-Bactrian king. Following the same logic, we shall now take a look at the coin struck by the Yabgu Eraos or Heraios. This ruler is only known to us from its coins, as it is also the case for the majority of Greco-Bactrian and Indo-Greek kings. His coins show an exceptional mix of various influences, which also helps to broadly date his reign to around the middle of the first century CE. His portrayal, on the obvious, seems to be a genuine one, as a very close one, not to say an identical one, has been discovered in uh, northern Bactria in Halchayan, among several painted clay bas-reliefs. Its depiction on coins is deeply influenced by Greek Bactrian iconography in the way of picturing the best of the king looking to right. On the other hand, on reverse, several parallels have been drawn between the coins of Herius and Parthian and Indo-Parthian coinages. One must remember that the Parthian Empire was one of the major powers in the region at that time, which would naturally incite certain rulers to get inspiration from their coins. In the case of Herius, numerous elements appear to be borrowed from said coins. The king on horseback on rivers from Artabanus II, the flying Nike from Orodes II, and the same goddess crowning the king, who is however seated on certain civil issues of Gundafaris. Again, following the same logic as with the Helioclase and Eucratides imitations, we shall have a look at the distribution of these coins in northern Bactria, where they were clearly struck. Although the Tretrad rats and obols of Herios have not been discovered in such high numbers as imitation, it does appear that the fine spots are clearly consecrated in the Kafirnigan and the Varsh Valley. The Halchayan archaeological site, which we have spoken of earlier, is located in the upper Kafirnigan Valley, which would match this analysis. It has sometimes been interpreted as a Uyghur dynastic temple by certain scholars. This hypothesis would mean that the Uyghur tribe who struck the Eucratides imitations was later ruled by Yabgu, who would have been the first to put his name and the name of his tribe, 
the Kushans on this coin. If we take into consideration that this very tribe will be the one overpowering the, the other four, thus giving its name to the empire that's created, it should not be a surprise to us. The attempts made at trying to give a restitution of the geographical layout of the five UHU clans can mainly be summed up to the work of Franz Brunet in 2006 and Harry Falk in 2018. Grenet's article takes a close look at toponymy and its evolution throughout history, among other sources, in order to present what we may call a micro-regional interpretation in which all the clans are located on both banks of the Amudaya River, but within the limits of Bactria, with some northeastern extension in the upper Varsh Valley. Archaeology provides several anchoring points for this interpretation with the cities which are known for belonging to this period, namely Halchayan, Termes, Bactra, possibly Tatisangin, and Kunduz, which would have been the capital or main city, according to the Shiji, a Chinese written source of the second or the first century BCE. The restitution proposed by Harry Falk may, on the other hand, be called a micro-regional interpretation, since the various Yuji clans are distributed over a large territory extending over northern Bactria, southern Bactria, northern Pakistan, and the Pamirs. This interpretation, without going too much into the details of the onomastic interpretation, has the merit to put the Yuji clan into perspective in regards to Western China and their relationship with the Han Empire. It also addresses the question of what archaeology has to tell us in this mountainous region and the Kashgar, Yarkon, and Tashkogan regions. The diplomatic and military letters found in and west of Dunhuang, still unpublished in English or French, mentioning various contacts with the Yuichu, precisely mentions in the late first century BCE the clans of Sumi and Shuangmi, which would be located in Western Central Asia. Folk also heavily relies on the account of the travel of Maestitianos around 100 CE through Bactria up the Varsh Valley and, according to him, into the Pamirs. One of the major sites of the UHU period is Tilyatepe in Afghanistan, which is located about 100 kilometers west of Bactra. Discovered in 1978 by a Soviet and Afghan team of archaeologists led by Viktor Saryanidi, it is, with the stone vault Mosina Manai Khanum, the only example of tomb known to us in Bactria. It consists of a central princely tomb with a male individual along with several satellite tombs in which female individuals are buried. More than 20,000 objects have been found in those six tombs, all of them exceptional in their beauty, quality, and diversity. The objects bear witness of multiple artistic influences in the melting pots of Hellenistic, Parthian, Scythian, and Stepic features. Tilia Tepe can be dated to the second quarter of the first century CE, that is about the time when Herius is believed to have ruled. It is indeed rather tempting to identify the prince in tomb number four, the one with the male individual, with Herius, although there can be no absolute certainty that we are actually dealing with a Yuichi prince. According to the work of Henri Paul Francfort, Tilia Tepe shows a remarkable assemblage of various features and or heritages leading to a composite identity for the prince in the main tomb. Those can be detailed as such. A so-called Cetan Bactrian element with the ring necklace and Bactrian cameo uh, featuring the helmeted bust of the ruler, which seems to be heavily influenced by Eucratides I and at the time of Herius, which can be found on the silver coins of petty Bactrian kings of Pulages and of the same dynasty or group. A Greek or Oriental element with the wing Aphrodite and her particular way of swaying her hips. Her wings can possibly be associated with a psychopomp role. A Xiongnu element, which is observable in the funerary ritual, that is a central tomb with satellite forms, 
the wooden coffin in which they were buried, and the whole skulls and metapods which were deposited above said coffin at the time of the burial. A huge or crucial element was the cruel seat, which was found close to the head of the male tomb. This element finds a clear parallel with bronze coin series struck by Kujula Cathesis, the first Kushan emperor. We shall mention this special regalia again, let us say for now, that is quite a unique feature among Central Asian coinages. Finally, a Parthian or Indo-Parthian element with the ring necklace, which is distinctive dynastic feature, which can be found both on Gondophares and Otagnes coins. Among other objects were also found a Chinese mirror and, China and dragon on a gold applique. All things considered, we are thus dealing with a cultural and artistic melting pot, witnessing many forces at work at the time of the burial of the Tilia Tepe prince. At some point during the second half of the first century CE, the leader of the Kushan clan, a one Kujulak thesis, managed to take over the other four tribes and became the first emperor of what must now be called the Kushan Empire. The coinage of this emperor can be divided between anonymous issues and issues in his own name. Typically, the first is struck on copied denominations and types circulating in each of the localities he brought under his control, while the second always innovates at least on one side of the coin. Kujulak thesis adopts a specific tonga on a single series, the Roman Emperor coins, and still uses monograms on several others, doubtless depending on local monetary practices. The same logic may be followed when it comes to weight standards, as several of them are followed according to one or several coin series, such as the Indo-Greek one with the so-called Heracles series, with a tetradrag of about 9.60 grams. Towards the end of his reign, Kujula strikes coins with which highlight his dynastic heritage. According to Harry Falk, the variation in the writing of his name may be linked to the absence of practice of writing down his name. As for the coin series, which is clearly imitating a denarius struck by the Roman Emperor Augustus, it fits quite well within the context of Roman coins circulating in India and gives us a precious temnus postquem in order to date his coinage. What is more, several other strikes of Kujula on Gunnafaris demonstrate that he put an end to the indo parthian rule in the Paropamisade and Genda. The multiplicity of coin standards then stood as the first obstacle on the way to a unified monetary policy in the Kushan Empire. However, the coinage of Kujula Katfisis innovates in his own way by abandoning silver as a metal for striking coins. The route for this profound change in Central Asian coinages after its use for centuries must most likely be linked to the dramatic debasement of that metal during the first century BCE, in which Kujula took his part with the Hermaeus imitations. This led to an increase of the use of bronze coinages for substantial payments and a deep change in monetary habits as the silver coins must have lost the credibility as reliable currency. It is thus not a surprise if late in the first century CE may be found a coinage with the clear purpose of using a clear standard for both weights and denomination, the Sotomagus coinage. The coins of the so-called nameless king, that is the Sotomagus coinage, are a matter of deep controversy among numismatists and historians even more since the discovery of the Rabatak inscription in 1993. Whoever the issue was, most likely a Crucian, the Sotomagus coinage is absolutely fundamental as it establishes a standard currency from northern Bactria to Matura. The general type, with a bust of Mitra on obverse and the king on horseback on reverse, follows a slightly reduced attic standard with a drachm of about 4.20 grams. As we have seen earlier, the standard coinage was intended to replace the multiplicity of local coinages that the Kushans had in inherited. Numerous variations on the coins, such as the solar rays around Mithra's head, dissimilarities in the tenga, the square or cursive Greek letters, 
point to a huge monetary production. Indeed, the Sotomagus are more often than not found in substantial quantities in numerous archaeological sites over all of Central Asia. For instance, about 700 specimens were found in Bagram by Charles Mason in merely three years between 1833 and 1835. Even if the identity of the person still remains unclear, it is extremely likely that he was a high-ranking individual in the Kushan Empire, quite possibly a member of the royal family. This would explain how he would have been able to take over the empire and cast away the rightful heir to the throne. This rightful heir was Vimakat Thesis, and he probably was not able to claim control of the whole of the empire before getting rid of the usurper Sotomagus. The fact that he took over the very, tight, the very title of the latter could indicate that he indeed was the savior of the Kushan Empire or rather of his own dynasty. In the words of John Rosenfield, the coins of this emperor testify to the allure of a conquistador in the symbols of triumph and their imperious, aggressive style. Vimakatvisis inaugurates a new and crucial phase of the Kushan coinage with the striking of gold coins in the form of double status, status, and fourth of status. Thus, he is the founder of a bimetallic monetary system based on gold and copper putting an end to the bronze coinage of Kujula Kathesis and Sotomagus. As the sole dynast of a vast kingdom, Vima Kathesis used his portrait as a medium of propaganda to impress his subjects, the flaming shoulders suggesting superhuman capabilities. The latter can possibly be connected to the Zoroastrian concept of Kvarna, the royal glory. Although Vimakatvises can be seen on obvious making a, an act of worship to Fire Altar, his devotion to the Hindu god Shiva is attested on his coinage and signals a rupture with the Buddhist religious beliefs, which can be attributed to his rival and usurper. On the gold, as well as on the bronze coinage, Shiva, also named Osho, is depicted standing with or without the bull Nandi behind him. The troubles which took place at the beginning of his reign are illustrated by three series of gold coins, one of which is shown here. On these coins, Vimekatvisis makes sure to proclaim himself on the reverse as being the son of Vimetakto the Kusha. The design of these coins is itself seeking inspiration from the commemorative coins issued by certain greek bactrian kings in order to support their legitimacy as rulers. The inscription, which is the most instructive about Kushan genealogy, is the Rabatak inscription, which was found in 1993 in Afghanistan, not far from Sukhotal in southern Bactria. This document, which was engraved under the rule of Kanishka I, gives us the name of his father, grandfather, and great-grandfather. The beginning of the inscription can be translated as of the great savior Kanishka the Kushan, virtues just the autocrat the god worthy of worship who has obtained the royal dignity from Nana. Beyond this emphatic and rather usual title, the Rabatek inscription is especially interesting to us when it comes to the role played by the numerous divinities depicted on the Kushan coinage, which would thus be connected to royal investiture and dynastic court. Sokotal is one but of several temples which have been interpreted as dynastic ones with Halchayan and Mats in northern India. The statues depicting the Kushan emperors, were they commemorative ones or were they actually worshipped? The question remains open for now. Kanishka I introduces several major changes on his coinage. Greek is replaced by Bactrian, both for the king's royal literary and for the names of the gods and goddesses, and goddesses used on reverse which amounts to more than a dozen Greek, Iranian, and Indian gods. Among those, the goddess Nana especially plays a prominent role, although she was unknown in India before the reign of Kanishka I. Nana is closely related to the planet Venus, and one of her attributes is the crescent, a motif which seems to be absent from pre-Kushan Indian art. Nana also presents a similar role as the Sassanian goddess Anahita, 
when it comes to royalty and investiture, as well as with Artemis, from whom she borrows the bow and quiver on the coins of Huvishka. At this period, there was probably a mint south of the Indukush at Begram, close to the rich copper deposit of the Horban Valley, and the existence of two mints striking gold coins in, uh, at Bactra and in Gandhara is also a credible hypothesis. The reign of Kanishka I is traditionally considered to be the height of the Kushan Empire. His, su his successor, Yubishka, retained the weight of his predecessor gold dinar unchanged, while his coinage show a slight decrease in gold findings. His early copper coins followed Kanishka first weight system, but had three obvious types, that of the king riding an elephant, the king seated cross-legged, and the king reclining on the couch in the royal east post. However, his monetary types tend to show that he carried on with the political and religious agenda of his father. The diversification of divinities leads to the depiction of almost 30 of them on the reverse of his coins. The reign of Uvishka was a period of economical cutbacks. The copper coinage plunged in weight from a standard of 16 grams to, uh, to about 10 to 11 grams. The experiment was far from being a success. There was an extensive series of local unofficial imitations and Uvishka's successes eventually reverted to the earlier pattern of a full value copper denomination. Vasudeva I, is likely to be the last Kushan king to have ruled in the Balkh region, while his coinage is characterized by the almost exclusive of Oisho on the reverse, most of the time of a bull, with some rare coins depicting Vasudeva Krishna and Nana. The depiction of this goddess demonstrates that she was still active in the coronation process, although her role has been declining since the reign of Huvishka. Under the reign of Vasudeva I, the quality and weight of the copper coinage continue to decline. The weight standard for gold coins remain the same with a dinar weighing eight grams, but Vasudeva introduces a new main copper standard of eight to 10 grams and a lighter one of four to six grams. The multiple royal representations introduced by Yurishka are also abandoned, being replaced with the king sacrificing type of Vimakathesis and Kanishka I, with the latter addition of the Arthur art Trident. The name Vasudeva evokes the popular Hindu god. He was the first Kushan king to be named after an Indian god. However, Vasudeva I also had good relations with the Buddhists, as is witnessed by the numerous examples of donation to the communities. On the Silver Pixies published in 2017 by Harry Falk and Nicholas Sims Williams, the emperor is de depicted next to a Buddha. Despite his military qualities, Vasudeva I cannot avoid a total loss of control of the Kushan territories located north of the Indukush. This emperor is the last of the group of Kushan emperors, which are tra traditionally called the Great Kushans. After his death, seven Kushan rulers will follow each other over a time period of about 120 years until the middle of the 4th century CE. The weight standard of the gold coins dramatically plummets in parallel of the metal quality, down to the point when the gold coins actually grizzle when silver takes such an important place in the alloy, similar to white gold. At the same time, the bronze coinage shows a progressive extreme degradation in style. The control of the Gandhara region is lost around 260 CE, and the Kushan then only rule a region around Taxila and part of Northwest India. The chronology of that period remains obscure in part, although the Shapur the first inscription in Nakshi Mustam dated from 262, which gives a list of the Sasanian Eastern provinces, mentions the Kushan Empire as part of the territory, possibly as far as Peshawar. The role played by the Kushans in protecting and developing the commercial routes running from east to west commonly known as the Silk Roads, also remains to be determined. Were they active middlemen in these trades or mere protector of the route? Whichever the answer, it is certain that the extraordinary wealth which characterizes the Pax Kushana 
at the end of the first and during the second century CE must be multifactorial, among which may be mentioned a large and probably subsidized development of irrigation and thus substantial increase in agricultural income, as well as long distance trade of luxury goods from the Kushan Empire. Imports of the latter in the empire, such as Chinese mirrors, is also proof of such wealth and once again raises the question of the relationships between the Kushans and the Han Empire. Indeed, written sources indicate that they are characterized by perceptual ups and downs, and especially in connection with power struggles around the cities of Kashgar and Yarkand. Although it seems that any attempt at considering the Kushan Empire as a whole must end up with a map of the Silk Roads, we hope to have shown that both the Yuichu and the Kushan coinages are deeply connected and influenced by context and neighboring powers. From the early days of settling down in Bactria, these coinages showed unusual capacity to creativity and adaptation to external and internal factors. The outreach of the Kushan Empire which has been sometime, which has sometimes been compared to the one the Roman Empire had for the Mediterranean world, cannot be understated. Through the coins, their iconography, their evolution, their features as currency, our attempts at understanding and characterizing Yuichu and Kushan history takes shape, take shape, while archaeology remains an indispensable tool in order to seize the reality of this outstanding period of Central Asia. I thank you all for your attention.